calm about it because who could I tell? I had told the chief of staff, I had told the defense minister, and they didn't seem to believe me. So I went back home. The next day, I got a call from the embassy in France, and the same lady, Catherine, said, this man is back here and wants to know what progress you had made in getting the president of Liberia to send you to the embassy to collect the information. I told her I had made no progress and I wanted to speak with the man. When I spoke with him, I assured him that I had not talked to the president, but I had talked to the defense minister and the chief of staff, and it seems as if they didn't believe my story. So it, was there anything he could do to help me to convince them that he was telling the truth? He said, okay, get a paper, and a pencil and I will give you a few information that I can use and double check to see if I'm lying and I said okay and he gave me the name of the ship which I do not know now all those documents got missing in the war the name of the ship that brought the arms and ammunition to Liberia and he told me write down Firestone Biological Research Center and I wrote it down and I said, what is that? He's, I said, I know the Biological Research Center in Firestone. He said, I said, then what I got to do with that? He said, that is a name that was placed on those large containers that brought the arms and ammunition. It was marked Firestone Biological Research Center, but it never went to Firestone. It was taken straight up to the Crown Basel Forest. And he said, Emmanuel, you have to be careful. You cannot afford to let this information fall into the hands of people on the fourth floor of the mansion because they will eliminate you. He said, I am in France now in hiding because the people that they gave these weapons to are hunting me down. That's why I cannot even call my name to you. He said, but I know you very well from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., and I know how well you defended your government and that is why I have the confidence to tell you this. So go and tell them these two things. If they do not believe you, come back to me and I will tell you what to do. When I got that information, I went back to Minister Allison and Chief of Staff Duba. Minister Allison repeated that he had nothing to do with me unless I told him who was this person and so I left and decided that I would go straight to the president of Liberia Samuel Kanyando and let him know so that night I drove to the mansion and it was 8 o'clock at night uh, it might surprise some people to know that the whole time that I was Minister of Information I never had the president's telephone number because the whole while the whole 10 years he was alive because I used to be just bold in telling him things people gave the impression that I was against him there were people in the street who had his telephone number but I was Minister of Information I did not have it and so I had to go through all kinds of channels to tell him that night that I had something urgent to tell him and so they told me to sit down I sat down after the TV news he came and sat by me and said yes what do you say my man and I said, I got something to tell you. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I just got to tell you. He said, yeah, what's that? And I said, you know, um, there's a man in France. And I told him what the man had told me and all of that. I said, I went to the defense ministry, but your joint security people don't believe me. And um, I don't know what to do, so I just came to let you know. He said, Booyah, man, don't worry about that, man. Go sit down. Who, who will do anything here? He said, in fact, uh, you know that people can lie. That man just looking for money. I said, he's not looking for money because he didn't tell me his name. He doesn't want to tell me his name. And, but I did not tell President Doe that people on his fourth floor was involved. Because you see, when you deal with information, uh, one theory in public relations is that you tell the person on what they call need-to-know basis. You tell people on a need to know basis 
There was no need to tell President Doe that people on his fourth floor were involved. When in fact he did not even believe that it was happening. Then I become the suspicious person and then they will charge me for being in touch with some foreign agent in France and the joint security could turn that thing around and I will find myself in a different place. So I just told him that the man only wants you to send me to France, to the embassy. And he, did, he will deliver these things, the video tip and the photograph to me in the presence of your ambassador. He said, oh man, my man, go do your work, man. Got time for that. I'm mean, just looking for money. So I left. I left. The next day, the man went back to the embassy in France. And Catherine called me again. So you, you got, he said, you say you're not serious about things, huh? I said, why? He said, because this man looks like he's desperate. Or didn't he talk and look like it's true? I said, well, I've told the defense minister, I've told the chief of staff, I've told the president, and nobody seems to really understand this thing. They think I'm making up something. And maybe they're used to people lying to them for money, so they think I'm lying for money. But I, I have no reason to talk this thing. The only reason why I'm talking it is because if I don't talk it, they will say I didn't tell them. So I went there. And the man told me for the last time, he said, Emmanuel, I said, yes. He said, I knew you very well in Washington, D.C. If I call my name, you will know me, but I'm not calling my name. He said, I want you to be very careful. Your life is in danger because the information you are now carrying to people in the government is a dangerous information. And he told me, some of these people you have talked to, and I only talked to three persons. The president, the chief of staff, and the defense minister. And he told me some of these people you have talked to could be linked to what I'm telling you. So you have to be very careful. Now can you imagine, I'm trying to help the people and they say some of the same people involved. So that was a case of Kuku Jumoku. So I just listen to him he said your president is in danger and you are in danger simply because you are bearing the information it's a dangerous information because the people eliminate you before they let you expose this information see that's why they are discouraging the president from sending you to france he said but i just want to tell you something take a pen and a paper and mark some more things down i took the pen and the paper the gentleman told me that the ship that brought in the arms and ammunition was the same ship that brought in the light blue Volvo car for your director of the National Security Agency, Flomo, Washington. Then I knew he knew what he was talking about because he called the names of the people. He said, Flomo Washington received his Volvo car some time ago. The same ship that brought that Volvo car brought the arms and ammunition marked Firestone Biological Research Center. Number one. Number two. He said, as I'm speaking to you, a telephone bomb has been imported into Liberia. Somebody close to the president has it. Very soon the president's telephone will malfunction and they will go there and change the telephone and then somebody will call him and when they are sure that he's the one speaking, they will press a button and blow his head off his shoulders. Can you imagine being told that kind of information? And I'm supposed to go tell Doe. <laughs> and um, so he said you have to be very careful. He said this is the last time I'm going to speak to you. I wish you good luck. He said but the information I've given you is dangerous. So please be careful. So I said, uh, please, sir, could you do me a favor? He said, yes. I said, could you take that information you have to England? Willie Givings is now the ambassador in England at the court of St. James. He's a very good friend of the president. 
The president trusts him very well. Could you take that information to him? He will definitely deliver it to the president because the president doesn't seem to want to send me to you. He said, Emmanuel, I said, yes. He said, there are a lot of things you don't understand. Though my trust givings, but I don't trust givings with this information. So I'm not going to givings. That's the wrong person to send me to. He said, in fact, I should tell you that is why I'm in hiding now because some of them have leaked the information to the people who I want to get even with and they are looking for me. And I said, could you do one thing next? He said, what? I said, take the information to Italy. In Italy, there is a man called Myers. I think Joe or Gabriel, one of them. One of, one of them was police director, one of them was ambassador. Who was the police director? Okay, then there was Gabriel Myers, who was the ambassador in Italy. I said, Gabriel Myers and the, and the president are from the same home county. He trusts him very well. So take the information to Gabriel Myers and let Gabriel Myers bring it to Liberia because the president does not want me to travel. He said, okay, Emmanuel, I will promise you one thing. I will go to Gabriel Myers and I will give him a list of arms and ammunitions to take to President Doe. When President Doe received that, then he should send you here and I will deliver the rest to you personally. I don't trust anybody else again. I said, okay, that's a deal. It's a very good deal. He said, okay, if I don't hear anything concrete from you again, goodbye, but I'm going now. I'm leaving for Italy to give the list to Gabriel Myers, Ambassador Gabriel Myers. I said, okay. He left. And I went back to the defense ministry because I, I was not going back to the mansion. The president has said, no, that nothing and people wanted money. So he discouraged me about pursuing anything with him because I didn't want him to say that I was trying to beat up something to get money. And number two, the president had been told that I was a troublemaker on the university campus. And he always wanted to discuss military matters with me and I always evaded discussing it with him. He would discuss it with some of my younger friends in the cabinet and they were, you know, they were talking military business. They were inducted into the army. I refused. I didn't even get inducted into the army. And so he always considered me a coward. And that was very good. Because ta coward lives to see another day. And so I didn't, I didn't go back to, to I went back to Lieutenant General Duba and General Allison. Lieutenant General Duba is now the senior advisor to the defense ministry. Everything I'm saying here, double check it with him. God always keep my witnesses alive. And so I went back to the two gentlemen. I didn't know how to discuss this thing with them now. I told them, I said, look, this thing is serious. This man keeps calling me to tell me that something will happen. And I'm telling you all, and you think, you don't believe me. I said, I, I really do know this man. He said he saw me at a National Press Club in Washington, D.C. That's why he has confidence in me, but I don't know him. But why you don't let somebody go and double check this thing? Allison insisted that as long as I don't call man name, he doesn't want to deal with the situation. So I said, okay, let me give you a very blank, straightforward, graphic situation. The man said, that a ship that brought the arms and ammunition into this country brought a member of your joint security car here. The light blue Volvo car of Flumber, Washington. Why you don't check that out? He said, okay, he marked it down. So we'll check it out. The man said, there's a telephone bomb in this country waiting to blow those head off. Uh, the Lieutenant General Duba said, man, booyah, move from here, man. You ever seen a, a bag got telephone bomb before? Then Allison said, no, no, Duba, don't say that. He said, I'm a signal officer in the army. He said, we make telephone bombs. He said, you wire the telephone with 220 wires, and you send it to the person, and they connect it. And when you call the person, and you show that a voice, you just press a certain button, they blow the person's head off. So now Duba said, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Chief, let me use your telephone. He grabbed the telephone, he started dialing. He said, funny, funny, don't answer the telephone that I come home. Don't answer the telephone that I come home. <laughs> he, he was calling his wife to tell his wife not to answer the telephone. <laughs> I mean, these are, these are the kind of fun that helped me to survive the war. <laughs> Go ahead, ask your Duba. He said, funny, don't answer the telephone that I come home. I got something to tell you. <laughs> so, I sat there and laughed for a while. Then they went and checked and found out that the ship that brought the arms and ammunition, according to what that man told us, actually brought from Washington's blue Volvo car. And the man told me that the security people who should have been double checking everything on the ship were so happy that the boss man had a new Volvo car that they all went home rejoicing happily ever after. And the arms and ammunition slipped out of Morovia into the Crown Basa forest. I told that story to them. They didn't believe it. That was the last time I ever went back there to talk to them about it. Because this man in France refused to call me, so I had no additional information. But true to his word, he went to Italy and presented to Ambassador Gabriel Myers the complete list of the arms and ammunition that had been brought into Liberia. He kept his word. And he went to France and delivered the list. Gabriel Myers was from Grand Judea, just like Doe. Gabriel Myers came to Morovia with the list. The man had briefed him to come to Morovia and contact me, not to contact the people on the full floor of the mansion because some of them were involved, to come straight to me and contact me so that I would take him, take the list to President Doe. But you see, because Gabriel Myers did not consider me to be part of the inner circle because they didn't come from there. So he went straight to the mansion and said he wanted to see President Doe. The people in the mansion asked him why he wanted to see President Doe about his very important security matters. So they coaxed him and coaxed him until he turned the list over to them. True story. Gabriel Meyer is still alive and not dead. Tell him I say so because it's a true story. They cooked him and he showed a list of them and told them about how this man has sent him to warn Doe about the, 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 these ammunition and arms and other things that were buried in the Crown Basa forest. So they told him, okay, we'll tell the chief. He left. For more than one month, Gabriel Myers' ambassador, who came to Morovia to meet the head of state, could not see the head of state. He was effectively blocked. Even though he was ambassador, he did not know Liberian politics. He did not know you can be vice president if the people on the fourth floor want to block you from the president. You not see the president. Because they will tell you all the lies again. Tell you, oh no, he know he got some ambassador in there. Behold, it's a lie, the man alone. They will tell you anything to keep you away. And I who had talk to this man and send this man to Gabriel Myers. Gabriel Myers came in order to find favor with the king. So he went straight into the chamber room where all carry me along. I could, who could have helped him? Because as minister of information, I could go into the office of the president anytime. So after one month or so, the people on the fourth floor panicked. Because this Gabriel Myers is still hanging around here, insisting he must see the president about this list of arms and ammunition. So somebody simply went to the president and told the president that the foreign ministry did not call Gabriel Myers home. He did not even ask for permission to come home. He deserted his post in Italy. He's in Moravia hanging around with these girls and he's not at his post. So Do got angry. Right and tell and say I will draw the man from Italy. They announced it. He and his people panicked. They went back. They started begging Doe and all like that. Doe said, okay, I sign him as, as, as a 
dispersing officer at the finance ministry. So from the ambassador, he became dispersing officer. He and his list of arms and ammunition parted. So now when that happened to Gabriel Meyer, I knew I had to keep my mouth shut. Because those who are on the fourth floor now will be watching to see who's next. And my pa ain't born no fool. So I kept shut because I knew the fullness of time would come. And this is the fullness of time. But we'll be able to talk about it freely. I went to the mansion one day and met Gabriel Myers there talking with Deputy Minister Yancey Peter Fly in a rage. They were talking crumb. I couldn't understand it, but then when I got there, Fly spoke a few words in English and I could understand it, but some kind of list of arms and ammunition. I said, uh, Ambassador Myers, he said, yes. Yeah. I said, did, did a man, an old man, a white man, come to you in Italy and give you a list to bring to me? He said, yes. I said, and you've been here all this time, you never came to see me? He said, but I think I'm talking now. I came here to get a list to the chief. They both blocked me, and this and this and this and this. I just look at him, I said, Lord, help this boy. You should have brought a list to me. You took it to the people who you're not supposed to carry it to. I'm telling this story for you young, anxious people who don't want to follow some protocol and just run into things. You could be running into the wrong thing. So he talked, talk, 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 talk. Then General Glee, the ADC to the president, came in there and, and he that the first time you were hearing about it. And Gary Meyer showed him a copy of the list. And I saw a copy of the list. So Glee said, uh, we gotta check on this thing. And I told Glee, well, this thing was noon long ago. I told the president he didn't do anything about it. Did the, the NSC director car were in that same vehicle, I'm in that same ship and everything, nothing happened. So I'm not gonna say anything. And he said, I don't know anything about security, you go do your thing. So he said, I'm gonna send people in the crown bars for us to search. I said, okay. I thought you had told an NSA and the military and other people to go search, but he took it as a private project. After some time, he told me that they searched the Crown Basel Forest and they found two cartoons of um, military uniforms. But they didn't see, there were no sign of any weapons. I said, that's fine. I'm not going to argue with you. And so, that whole thing died down. Died down. And the beat went on until Allison got in his trouble and was removed from the Ministry of Defense. And Allison's story is a whole day story. So I will not start it now, we'll just go on to other things. We can come back to it later on. Allison's story is a whole day story of how Allison um, was on the way to the, to, to, to the, to the top post and um, he got betrayed. It's a whole day story which will not start today. So Allison got removed. General Burma Barkley went to the defense ministry. We heard no more about the arms and ammunition. Boy up his mouth shut. Go home. Play music loud in the night. About 10, 11, 12, leave his house and go to sleep in one of the 10 safe houses he established for himself between OAU Conference Center and the Red Light. There were 10 safe houses in this town where I could go any hour of the night, put my keys in the door and just open up and they would say welcome. I'm telling you to tell you that when you in the system, don't be a fool. Wash your back. The same system will be trying to mess with you. The president called me many times. Boy, where did you sleep last night? I said, I slept home, sir. No, you didn't sleep home. The security said you didn't sleep home. I said, were you looking for me? He said, no. I was asking him about you. He said, but is that why you want no security guard? I, I, I sent security guard to you, so you want security guard? I said, no, I don't want security guard. I'm a street boy. I can protect myself. 
If I had no bodyguard at my house or anywhere to protect me because I did not want them. And you know why? Young people got to look at the past. There are people who don't like history. I'm so sorry for you. You are dead body. You are walking dead body. I was right in this town when the coup came. And a very security guard where the people taking people to the barracks. And jailing them and arranging for the execution. Then you make me minister information and I will have a bodyguard. I do not need one. I'm a street boy. A man so cool, ill and dry meat in the market and I was a street boy. That's what I told though. I don't want no bodyguard. Every time you say, the, the security people say, they don't understand why you want bodyguard. I said, because I don't need one. Look how humble me. I said, nothing bad. Then we start hearing rumors of war. Mr. Sylvester Moses, the, he was at the NSA, came with some photographs of people training in Libya and Burkina Faso. He called me, he called Maurice Dukley, he called Al Haji Kroman to a house, I think one of our houses, I forgot who house it was. But he said, I want to tell you something because you're working with the chief and you're the young guys. That anything happen, you will be messed up. We said, what's that? He showed us the color photographs of people training in Libya and Burkina Faso. Some of the people are identifiable today, but I'm too old now. I can't identify them. My eyes too blind to see them. <laughs> But we saw them training. And he said, I've taken these photographs to President Doe. President Doe does not believe me. In fact, he's saying that these people are not military people. And let them come, he will deal with them. He said, but I must tell you all, if President Doe waits until these people hit Monrovia or Liberia, it will be too late. The best thing to do is to counteract them through any means possible where they are training. So because you are all going to the same Babangida school with Do, I thought to let you all know so you could advise him what to do. As for me, I had determined that my role was not military, it was not security, it was public diplomacy or public relations and therefore or public affairs and therefore I would deal with Do on a public affairs level and leave his military business with him since he could only believe a certain group of people when he came to military situation. Then Mr. Barkas Matthews who was a loyal opposition to Do. Now what do I mean by loyal opposition? A loyal opposition is somebody who is not on your side but somebody who want to play a fair game with you. He will wait under election to defeat you. He will not do it behind the scene. In your letter to me from the TRC, you call, you call on me to give you a background to how Torba was killed. That is a whole day job. So I will not talk about it today. But I will just talk about one aspect of that that has to do with Barkas Matthews. If you go to Power FM TV, and I want you to please take that note so you can check them out. In 2007, Mr. Matthews and I, I think it was May 2007, Mr. Matthews and I had a debate on Power TV. Contact Mr. Aaron Cully. He will give you the tip, the video tip of that debate. Mr. Matthew was arguing just like uh, somebody else talked about here that he moved on the mansion because there was a right wing Trui party coup d'etat in action and he wanted to forestall that action and therefore he moved on the mansion to stop this right wing coup. And I said on that radio program, I told Mr. Matthews that my understanding was that it was true that there was a coup plan against Talbot 
not only the door coup, trouble had about three coups against him. The poor fella just trusted too many persons. There was an inside job being performed. And we were just a little and sitting there around and the people used to look at us like furnitures. You know when you're a little boy around big old people, they just talk anything. And they think you wanted the chairs you can't hear. <laughs> so they used to be talking all kinds of things and we used to listen. The first time I got a hint that there was problem against Talbot was when I visited uh, my friend Francis Chuchu Horton at the Bank of Liberia. When I was coming out of his office, one of President Talbot's daughters, who was married, who is married to Tony King, I think. Yeah, that was her. She married to Tony King. She's not a doctor. She's the financier. When she came outside, when, when we came outside, Chuchu was bringing me halfway. Then uh, uh, Chuchu told her, oh, man, what all this thing? Here, you're having a meeting with Judge really and this group and that group. And she said, yes, yeah, so they got all kind of news around that there's some coup or something and really was involved and they called a family meeting and really denied it and all kinds of things. And I was standing there like a furniture again. And they went on talking. And that was the first time I really knew that there could have been something going on. It was also revealed that certain ministers of the double government have been having meetings. Because they had determined that Tower was too weak to counteract these progressive movements. And he was showing too, many, too much uh, um, sympathy. For instance, they accused him of locking up Khan Kala and some other people at BDC and locking up Bagas Matthew separately at NSA and allowing Bagas' girlfriend to visit him in the night and doing all kinds of favors for him. That's what they accused him of. And therefore, they felt that Torah was just too weak. So, before these progressive people can kind of mess with them, the best thing would be to remove him. So, I left off to come to talk this from the place where I was saying that Matthews was a loyal opposition. Matthews brought color photograph to the government of Liberia. To inform them that there were people planning to bring war to Liberia. Abuya saw the photograph of my eyes. I didn't know what they say. I say. I'm sorry the man I hear now, but you as his power people they might be able to tell you something. Again, do thank Matthews and all of that and say, Oh man, the people know that military people let them come with we'll deal with them. So two times they got color photographs and nothing happened. So Matthews was those loyal opposition. When we're at that tele 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 television program, Matthews revealed that he went to the mansion not to cause trouble but to forestall a right wing coup in the Tree Party. I cannot deny that there might have been an upheaval from inside. I cannot deny that because I have no proof to deny that. I have bits and pieces that will point to that. And in the fullness of time, that will be revealed. But Matthew said he went there to force one Talbot. He, won he said at that interview, and is there, and I took notes. That's what I was trying to look for here. During that interview, he said, he went and warned Talbot, and I think Mr. Kala said so too, and told Talbot about a right-wing coup, and Talbot agreed that he knew about the making of a right-wing coup within the Tory party. Matthew said that. And because of that, Matthew said, he moved on the mansion that night to stop that right-wing coup from prospering. Well, I agree with what he said in that he said it, so I got to agree with what he said. But I have my own views, and I told Mr. Matthews why he was alive on that interview that I want you to go and get that part of your record. You can't leave it out. 
I told Mr. Matthews, I said, you said that in February you won, in February 1980, you warned Talbot about a right-wing coup. You discussed it with Talbot. In March, you and Talbot met for the second time. You were supposed to meet and Talbot did not meet you. And you were encouraged to carry the most, you encouraged Talbot. Matthew encouraged Talbot, according to him, to carry the most loyal troops from, from the mansion with him to Nimba County because he was afraid that somebody could bump Talbot off in Nimba County. Check the tip I'm telling you about. And Matthew said that there was no preparation in Butuo to protect Talbot during that visit. That's why he warned Talbot to take his loyal troops with him. March 3rd, 1980. Parker's knew of plan to and insist to, 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 to unseat Talbot that night. Parker's went to West Point, according to him, and got 500 persons. They marched to the Ministry of Information and were stopped by soldiers. They saw official cars leaving the mansion from the meeting. They went in and sat to ask why they went in, the people went in to ask why Matthews was there. He told them to tell Talbot, that is the mansion guard, he told them to tell Talbot that he was at the mansion because on the last conversation he held with Talbot, the thing he discussed with Talbot was the reason why he was in the mansion yard. He told them to call Talbot and tell him. He told Talbot, them to tell Talbot to come to Monrovia at once. And the cabinet had a checkpoint at Bentall to divert the president to Bentall and not to Monrovia when he was coming back. I'm telling you what Matthew said, check the, check the tip. Augusta Kane, with tears in his eyes, went to the meeting with Matthews and told them that many in the Senate supported their call for Talbot to resign, according to Mr. Matthews. Check the tip. They came and took to Talbot and the, 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 Matthew said they went to Talbot and changed the whole story. They convinced Talbot to broadcast on TV and radio that Matthews wanted to forcefully overtake the mansion and therefore he got arrested. They sent to arrest him. He experienced, he, he, he escaped to the Vatican Embassy. Check the tip. He told them that he was willing to surrender to the government. Bishop D.E.B.B.S. The, the ambassador to Liberia at that time from the Vatican, in the presence of Bishop Dahlia, took him to the mansion and he was sent to post Stockett, March 1980 was in complete isolation when the coup took place. He said, I knew nothing of it. Check the tip. He said he was released early morning and taken to the mansion on April 12th along with Oscar Queer and Chair Chipo. These are the notes I took when I was, when Bafi and myself were on the interview. You see, when you go somewhere, even if they call you for an interview on radio, TV, and the interview go on, don't just sit there and wait for the next question. Be taking down important points. You will need them in the future for another TRC. <laughs> then I answer Mr. Matthews. And you can find it on the tip. I said, Mr. Matthews, to the best of my recollection, 
you are telling us now that the Tory party had a right wing coup that you are trying to stop. I said, I agree with you. But the real reason why I think you went to the mansion was because of a transaction that went between, on between you and President Talbot. I said, do you remember you went to the mansion about three times to warn President Talbot about a coup and the people in the mansion would not let you see Talbot? And he just looked at me, he didn't answer. And I said, I was there because I was the one who used to be sent for all the time by uh, D.L. Wood Dunn. And I think I got Dunn telephone number here I will give to you so you can contact him. D.L. Wood Dunn called me to the mansion many times to draft speeches for the president. In fact, I've written speeches for three presidents of Liberia. I was too young when Topo was in power. I did not write for Taylor. But I've written for three presidents. So you can do your homework. Now, um, I told him, I said, I was called to write speeches for President Talbot. D. Elwood don't used to call me. I said, during one of those times, I was in the mansion when the conversation came out about you going to warn Talbot about a coup. And the people around Talbot told him not to listen to you because you said the military was about to strike. And you came to warn Talbot so that the, you could fix things up. The people around Talbot told him not to listen to Matthews. After Matthews went there the third time and they wouldn't let him see President Talbot, he wrote a note in handwriting on a scrap of paper. Ask Dr. Dunn if it is not true. And that note said, in essence, Mr. President, we are of the same heritage. We have every reason for which to cooperate. Please let me see you. It is of grave urgency. Well, Matthew was considered to be a crazy boy in those days. So the letter went, everybody read the scrap of paper, oh, move from here, man, move to. So I told them I wanted the scrap of paper. They gave it to me. It's among my papers in America. Why? Because I have a sense of history. Everybody thought Matthew was crazy. I just said, well, turn that crazy paper to me. So I kept that crazy paper. I asked Dr. Dunn whether he doesn't know about that paper. And he will come before the TRC. We'll all be here. I'm telling you all this to tell people in government today, do not overlook anything. Do not think you are secure. When you think you are more secure, that you are on the verge of being bumped off. I repeat, when you think you are more secure, you are on the verge of being bumped off. Of. When you get too secure, then you become a God unto yourself, and God will share his glory with no one. He'll mess you up. He will mess you up. So everybody said Matthew was crazy. I said, Matthew, you know what happened? You know my theory about why you went to the mansion? Because you went three times to warn Tom, but nobody wanted to listen to you, and the news started to circulate that Matthew had come here to warn Tom about something. And you, Matthew, panic because you knew that if the news got back to those soldiers, you would be messed up. So you move on the mansion so they could arrest you and put you inside. And there where you were when the coup came. And he said, oh no, boy, I don't know it. I said, well, Matthew, the mind theory. Go check the tape. It's at Aaron Colley's TV station, Power FM. And that's what they call it. It's there. When I agreed to come to this TRC, I agreed to come to wash my belly. Our traditional people, when we say you wash your belly, that means when you leave, you have nothing inside you. Only your little guts. Me, you call me here, be prepared. I'm not a little boy to call me here for nothing. That's why you see me joking all around with people. I got too much in my mind to be talking all around. Because when I talk all around, anything I talk is something. Okay. So Matthews manipulated himself into the prison. And in the comfort of the prison, the coup occurred. He was brought out. I saw... A newspaper headline that said that Doe wanted Matthews to be president. That is a fact. From my investigation with the TRPRC, 
They only wanted to be defense minister. He didn't want to be head of state because, you know, it's like you take me now, you say, you want to make me God. I don't know why it is to be God. How can I be God? So he wanted to be defense minister. And because Matthew had been the one that he knew and everything, he wanted Matthew to be the head of state. But like somebody said, from the minute the coup succeeded, a bitter rivalry developed between Moja and Powell. This is a fact. I was there. I saw it. I experienced it. And I challenged them to say I'm lying. I challenged them to a debate. They all started fighting about who will control what. Because they were all politicians and um, what they call them, uh, econom economists and all of that. Moja managed to hold on to do in the first few months when they send people like Wolokali and some other people to work in the mansion on the staff. Paul gravitated toward Wesang and so Kankala emerged as the coordinator of the PRC in the Capitol building and from that point on you saw Moja and Paul stacking the deck. By that time, we were people from the old regime, the Trui Party. We had to go into hiding in Basa community for several months. One night, I was into hiding in Basa community, and old Robert had his show on. And the theme song was, something good is going to happen to you today. So I said, let me watch and see what the Opa got to say. And old Robert spoke. And he told the story of the two blind men who were sitting outside of the city. And all of Israel were afraid because they were scared to enter a city. They were sitting outside hungry. And they sat there for days and they were about to die from hunger. And the two blind men told themselves, well, let us go into the city. If we sit here, we'll die. If we go in, we'll die. So let's go. Maybe we'll just eat and not die. The courage of those two blind men took them into that city. Because one man said to the other man, Why sit we here till we die? And so, Oraba said that night, If you are in a situation where you cannot make a decision, just be bold enough to make a move. If you die, you die. But don't sit there. Why sit we here till we die? By this time, it was about June 1980, to the end of June 1980. April, May, June. Uh, Alhaji Kumar had already been appointed in the government. My name and the name of Maurice Dugley were published and were told not to go around any government installation because we were agents of the True Party. In fact, uh, Mr. Taylor, who had taken over GSA, arrested me. Put my name on the radio, came and arrested me, said, uh, You are the coordinator of the True Party. We heard that you know about the party properties and everything. And so um, you would turn that over to me or I'll put you inside. He said, uh, you know what happened, young man? I said, no, sir. You would meet me at the Ministry of Information at 8 o'clock every morning. And you'll be my man. And you would show me the three part of people property or I'll put you inside. I said, yes, sir. The same tailor I had been a public relations officer, the three part of people had assigned me to tailor when he arrived here about a year before. And I was supposed to prepare him to become commissioner of art and towns before they brought him to town to get him a big job. They wanted to check him out in his home hometown. And because I had prepared the Public Affairs Bureau of the Tui Party and they saw what I could do, they assigned me to brush Taylor's image up. So you see, sometimes I feel that the, the system has really misused me. The same system assigned me to Taylor. The same Taylor come and arrest me again. Taylor and Doe becomes friends. Their friendship chakra 
Taylor runs away as if though the same Taylor group come I had to run away again. The system has misused me. But this Taylor and Doe thing is a whole day talk. Because they were two very good friends. Best of friends. The only person that was more friendly with Doe than Taylor was Kuangba. Doe and Taylor were the best of friends. Those were the days that we thought would never end. And the young people should know it because today the young people hear about Doe and Taylor the thing they were fighting since they were born. No, those two boys were very good friends. And they were involving all kind of little things. They juked the rest of us. And then they fell apart. That's another story. So Taylor arrested me and told me to meet him every morning at 8 o'clock. I used to go to the Ministry of Information and meet him. The second morning I, was, I met him at the Information Ministry, the car came around that circle at the Ministry of Information. He just opened the car, put his one foot on the ground. Uh, where is Peabody? Where is Peabody? And you're talking about Stanton Peabody. He's the one who's been writing all kind of nonsense in the librarian age. He's my man. I want him. Where is Peabody? Nobody wanted to talk. He turned to me. Do you know Peabody? I said, no, sir. I don't know Peabody. <laughs> I knew the man, but why would I tell him when Taylor dressed up in a military uniform, dark glasses, smoking a cigar? <laughs> I said, I do not know him. <laughs> okay, tell people my name is Charles MacArthur Taylor. And General MacArthur said, I shall return. I return for his ass. Tell him. He slammed the door. Let's move. We we'll move down to Jensen down water side. Taylor was seated on the left hand, on the right hand side of the Volvo, or the Volks, not Volvo, uh, Mercedes Benz. I was seated in the center, there was a soldier on my other side, and there was a soldier in front. We went down to Jensing, and that's when the number of things that constituted a dozen changed. You know, a dozen is usually 12, but that day it changed. There were 17 members in the PRC. And I went on a first shopping spree with Taylor when he had me hostage to buy those things. He got that, um, you have uh, Betamax videos? Yeah, 117. Bedroom set? Yeah, 17. TV? Yeah, 17. Everything was 17. So I, that day I jokingly said that the adulting had changed from 12 to 17. <laughs> we went around and bought all these things for these people. And I must tell you that Taylor did not get appointed by the P T R PRC, People Redemption Council. Taylor only heard that a coup had occurred. He, he ran to the barracks, got his military uniform from his in-law. Let me talk now, I beg you. Taylor never got appointed by Doe. He introduced his wife to me as Tupi. Later on, I came to realize that Tupi were related to the commanding general, Kuyongba. And so when the coup occurred and Kuyongba were in the barracks, Taylor just moved there and got his uniform as major in the armed forces of Liberia. While everybody else was doing something, he ran straight and took over GSA and put Hara Munger in jail. Munger is now the head of the IPA, Institute of Public Administration. Go and ask him whether I'm lying. All my witnesses are alive. He put Munger inside and took over the GSA. Well, those were the revolutionary days. There was another guy called Emmanuel Tote. He moved to the defense ministry, declared himself defense minister. The PRC got pissed off with him, drove him to the South Beach, and executed him on the spot. Emmanuel Tote. Check it out. But those were the days of the wild, wild west. Everybody who could grab something, grab it. And Taylor grabbed GSA. So 
when Taylor took me all around for three days he was asking me about the true we party uh, money and uh, everything luckily for me I had already written to the government surrendering a list of all the parties properties in the various counties and for those who thought that the PRC the, the, the true week party was a backwards party I submit that at some point in time it was such but as of 1979 the true week party was not a backwards party the true week party had a branch in every county we don't mean fake branch physical branch when the coup occurred, it was a Chui Party headquarters that it turned into the Bonkrier newspaper in Banga. I was general coordinator resp responsible for planting party headquarters in the various counties. There was a motor vehicle uh, company called the Pioneers Motors across the bridge um, uh, um, uh, Somalia Drive. We went there and bought four we drive jeep for every county and every territory our county chairpersons had a jeep the three party changed its structure we had permanent secretaries political affairs public affairs economic affairs all of the young guys and for you who think that you're so radical the first permanent secretary of the political affairs of the Tui party was Frederick Kova Gorowali, founder of the Student Unification Party, SUP, at the University of Liberia, 1979. The party had reached a place where the people inside knew if they did not change, it would not last and so the party was opening up that is when they brought us in and we told them how the things could be done i personally introduced mr gobawali who was then in lofa county to mr clarence simpson who were my boss when we were on a nationwide tour and i told him this gentleman established a student unification party and for more than 10 years he won the elections why didn't you bring him to the jury party and put him in charge of political affairs and so when the coup occurred, the founder of the Student Unification Party was Permanent Secretary for Political Affairs of the True Party. I'm just telling you that to tell you that things change. Things change sometimes. And they change so fast sometimes that you don't realize that. So today when Soup speaks, no mention is ever made of Frederick cover Godawali because he chose to change things from inside and his children and his relatives move around here like nobodies and people who were not around when he organized the party are riding the high tide of popularity for being soup vigilantes and soup cadres and soup this i can challenge them to tell me the history of soup i can set them down like little children and teach them how soup evolve from a poor dominated situation to a pro-socialist situation i was there from day one when frederick Gowley and Roosevelt Anderson had a popular debate on campus and Roosevelt Anderson referred to Frederick Gobawali as a country boy that he's going to integrate and Gobawali got angry and decided to form a group to defeat the Student Democratic Progressive Party that is why I told your chairman that you can never have this TRC we are calling me here because from 1970 to 1990 nothing happened in this country that I was not inside 20 years I challenged anybody to come and sit with me and talk so the people who were talking big talk today they were in school and were organizing things that they are not even finished writing their PhD dissertations okay let me go back to our situation 
Fortilla sent me with two soldiers to the Ijeroy building and told me that I should go there and get some documents that would help them to get the many millions of dollars that they heard at the two week party had abroad. <clears throat> and I said, okay. We went there. When we got up there, we saw a vault that had been broken into. The vault, they used an M16 or some powerful machine gun to shoot the vault open. And in an attempt to shoot the vault open, all of the American dollars bills burned up. They burned halfway, halfway. So I brought a handful of that back to Taylor and told him this is all we found them. Burn bills. He said, okay, my man, I heard that you know where the money is. Now, I've been joking with you. He said, you see those fellas over there that are about five soldiers, including one, uh, William Yato, who was uh, on BDRI when he was on KRTDI. Chilo on KRTDI, William Yato was on BDRI, military scholarship. So when a coup occurred, he got a crowd of boy around him. He said, you see those, those fellas over there? I said, yes, sir. They're ready to pounce on you right now. So you don't come straight with me, but tomorrow you'll be in post -tucket. I said, yes, sir. So go home tomorrow morning. I don't want any talk from you. Just come and tell me where the people got the money. I said, yes, sir. Now, young people, when you're in trouble, don't panic. That's another lesson. No matter how they threaten you, just say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and keep calm. The Bible says, in calm and confidence shall be your strength. Just keep calm. Let it just blow up. When the dust settles, you'll still be standing. Next morning, I approached Taylor. Uh, young man, you ready to talk to me? I said, yes, sir. What do you have to say? I said, um, Major Taylor, he said, yeah. I want to ask you something, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, but I don't want you to get vexed with me, oh. He said, no, I will get vexed with you. I said, no, just promise me you're not get vexed with me. Then I will tell you the thing. He said, okay, I'll not get vexed with you. I said, okay. I said, do you think that when Richard Henry's uh, William R. Talbot Jr., uh, Reginald Townsend, and Mike DeShield, and all these people get together to decide where they're going to bank their money, do you think they will call me to that meeting? He bustled and laughed. He laughed. He laughed. He said, he said what? I repeated it. He laughed and laughed and laughed. He said, you're damn right. You're damn right. Okay, you know what happened? You're still my man. You're beautiful me. He said, I'm going to the mansion. I'm going to the mansion. Follow me. Come, let's go. I'm taking you to the mansion. I was scared a little bit now. Because all this time we're running around an empty Ejera building. But now when you take me to the mansion, that's the, what we call the powerhouse. And fireworks can be there. When we got there, there was my friend George Bullet presiding as Minister of State. He had an M16 lying on his desk. And he said, uh, and you know, George and myself served on the Tree Party Tax Force. And unfortunately for him, they arrested him with the Power Boys and put him in jail. He and one Peters that used to work with other LEC or something they said they found them having a meeting with Bacchus. I don't know if it's true, but what they said. So Bully had not seen me since he went to jail. And when I got to the mansion escorted by Taylor, Taylor in his uniform, Bole in his uniform. Unless something trigger and Bole, I mean, Boya, where you been all this time? I said, I've been around. He said, oh, you been around? I said, yes. He said, okay, you will see. And Taylor said, now, George, what's going on here? This is my man. I'm a major in the armed forces of Liberia, and you're a major in the armed forces of Liberia. He's on a mind command. I just watch, I just watch and let them carry on their conversation. So Bolo say, uh, 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 the whole world they tomorrow go on, we didn't know where the man was. Where were you? I said, I told you I was around. Did you look for me? Taylor said, Joy, lead the man. Okay, then Taylor ordered me out of the room, I left the room. 
After that, the next day, one Mr. Bing, who was working with uh, Speaker Podia at that time, issued an order that the general coordinator of the Chui Party, Mr. Emmanuel Buya, is here by order to report to the office of the Speaker of the PRC. They gave the date and time. They gave me about five days to report. Everybody, all my relatives and friends were panicking. And I was walking the streets, eating my ground peas and doing some other things. Everybody, you hear what Podia said? I said, yes. Podia gave me five days to appear. I'm not stupid. I've been in Liberian politics for a long time. If I appear on the second day, he will want to hold me until the fifth day. So I'm going to appear on the fifth day. On the fifth day, I got dressed in my t-shirt, my blue jeans, and my sneakers. And I went to Mr. Bing at the Capitol building and told him that the former general coordinator of the Tree Party was there to meet the speaker of the you know, when you go somewhere, you got to talk big. Even though the party had been overthrown, I was still, I still kept my little out around. General coordinator. So when I went in there, you know, there was an office that petitioned by ceiling tiles. You could hear what happened. The man went in there. Oh, that pe the, 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 the three party man, yeah, okay, let him well deal with him. So then I said, I wonder what I did to this man. So when he got through talking, 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 and the person left, he said, Bring that man here. And he came in there. When he came in, he said, I ah, what a man. He said, yeah, he he said, <laughs> he said, you got house? I said, no. You got bank account? I said, no. What you got? Nothing. Get out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> These are laborers that are working for old people that are doing the old, old people work. Go, man. Who got that for you? So that's how I left. And I skipped that one. Then, as I was telling you this story about Oral Roberts, after that sermon by Oral Roberts, I called my friend Maurice Dugley, who and myself had been banned from going around any government installation. I said, Dugley, he said, yes, you are living across a bridge, Logan Town. I said, tomorrow morning, I want you to meet me at 9 o'clock in front of the Ministry of Information. We have a job tomorrow, or we start trouble in this town. Now, I'm just telling you now, I got two sides. When you see me acting calm, that a bastard diplomatic side. When my old lady gribble situation getting me, then we do some war dance. I said, Dougal, tomorrow we have a job or we cause trouble in this town. And that was just a f that was just June of 1980. He came there, I explained all our uh, sermon to him. I said, you know what happened? We're not sitting until we die. Let's go to the mansion. When we leave the mansion, we'll be employed. He said, Ham. I said, let's just go. You'll see what will happen. So Duke followed me. When there was a one, see Willie Givings. They took us in. I said, Mr. Givings, you know me very well. You know Duke He went away, got training with a Pan African news agency, went to Germany, got training in journalism. The, the system trained us to serve the government. The government has changed, and you will punish us for the change? I was here with you writing speeches for President Tolbert. but you know what I can do? I've been working in the Ministry of Information as Assistant Minister. And you have me hanging around. I said, if these guys who you said were not educated could have a coup in this town, what about college people like us? You don't think we can plan something too? I said, let me tell you one thing. Go in there and tell the head of state that I will suffer no more. I either get employed today or I will start my own trouble in this town. Kevin is still alive. Ask him. Kevin said, you don't have to talk like that. I said, look, I'm fed up that I'm talking like that. So go and tell him. Go and tell him. If they want to execute us, you should have executed all of us. But why must I just hang around here? You got people who don't know anything, doing all kinds of things. So they got job, they got this, they got that. I who work for the system all this time. I was recruited from the university. I said, have you ever heard that I wrote a letter of application in Liberia for a job? I never wrote any letter of application. Every job I ever held, they called me to get it because they know I can do what I can do. I never written one. I will never write one. Right now, I got some planting and cassava growing in my yard in Sinko. Seven bunches of planting bearing in my yard. 
my cassava patch is there i will eat until i die i do not have to write anybody or beg anybody so i told gary go tell that man they see where he can cause trouble i can cause trouble Gary said, okay, giving said, okay, uh, just sit and calm down. You got hard head. They're not the university thing you're doing. I said, okay, go. But I said, Giddings, Givings, before the end of this day, if I do not have a job, you have trouble on your hands. Giving went in and came by and said, okay, Buya, the president, the head of said he reassigned you to the Ministry of Information, a special assistant to Gabriel Nimlin, who is a minister. Do clear your go oh, and take over the bone crier newspaper. That how I got employed by the PRC. They came to power by violence, scaring us. I went and scared them too. True story, as Willie Givings, as Maurice Dugley. What I'm telling you here is that some of these people think that because we don't make noise in the streets so we are not revolutionary. I'm a revolutionary in my mind. I can just look at you, size you up, x-ray you, and mess you up with what you knowing that you are messed up. So I went back to work for the PRC government. I remember before I started working, I met with Barkas Matthews in the street. And I met with Du Mason in the street. And Du Mason asked me, where are you working now? I said, I'm not working anywhere. Did you all give me jobs and you took over? Uh, Du said, you know the problem with you, Buya? I said, no. He said, you always work for the wrong people. You're a smart man who always work for the wrong people. So I said, Du, are you telling me that you are the right people that have come to power? Yeah, he said, you got to come and work for the masses now. I said, okay. Well, not too long after that, he had to run out himself. He had to disappear himself. You cannot trust any future, however pleasant. So I started working for the People's Redemption Council. And then I was assigned after I left the Ministry of Information when something came and expelled me from there because of the Falavani in, 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 in memoriam of people that are condemned. I was sent to work with the new Liberian newspaper under the command of Thomas Kamara. Thomas Kamara is alive and well. He's the editor of the New Democrat newspaper. He and I ran that paper. At the same time, the Observer was operating. And I can submit to you that the Observer had a competition when Tom Kamara and I ran the new Liberian newspaper. You got enough money for research sent to let the Library of Congress allow you to photocopy those newspapers from the 1980s. And you see the editorials that Tom Kamara wrote, and you see the editorials that I wrote when I succeeded him. When I met President Doe Doctor, I wrote an editorial entitled What Dr. Doe Must Know. Read it. New Liberian. When things start to mess up here, I wrote a letter, an editorial after the Kuangba incident of 1983. I wrote an editorial entitled, If Unity Fails. Because by then I could see a crack in the system. These boys had come to power. They are all gathered together and executed one of their own friends, Wesang. When Wesang was gone, the contradiction in their ranks began to widen, and Kuangba and Do fell apart. I was here, and I saw it. There are many things I need to talk about which I cannot talk, because you say you're going to have thematic hearings. You're going to be talking about political parties. You're going to be talking about the student movement. You're going to be talking about the history of Liberia. You're going to be talking about a lot of things. And I just want to put you on notice that I've already invited myself to participate in all of those talks. Because I have information on all of those. When it comes to the party in this country, I was the last general coordinator of the Tree Party for your information, public affairs and tourism. That's how we used to say in the 80s. I was the last. When the PRC took over the People Redemption Council, 
everybody you treat everybody want on the ground we all want on the ground like my friend George Knuckles used to say time and place make the timid bold and time and place same time and place make the bold timid the timid became bold and the bold became timid and I got from underground and declared that I am a true party man I had nothing to be ashamed about my record is there to prove what I told the party and what I did in the party Mohammed e. Jones a lawyer is now working in the United States with a human rights law group I think Councillor Boo will know Mohammed Jones, they were all law people. Mohammed Jones became a research officer in the executive mansion after the coup. And when I was, I was reassigned to the Ministry of Information as Assistant Minister and Special Assistant to the Minister, the government sent a form to all officials to fill in specifically indicating that you should indicate your previous political alignment after we sent the papers in Mohammed Jones met me and said Boya I said yes he said that do you know in the future you are the only person qualified to claim the EJ Roy building I said why he said you're the only person in Liberia who told the PRC that you are a member of the Tory party I'm saying that to say that my father told me when you make a bad bargain, you stick to it. And so no matter what they say about the Tory party, I was a member. And I became general coordinator of the party. And if they had not much to show up by now, Liberia would have changed better than what we have it. Because it, I have the party, I have the, 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 the document to change the party in this book. And I submit to you, and I challenge anybody living or dead, that there's no political party in this country today that has a better platform than we had in 1979. None. Get this book compared to all your party platform around here. None can come up to it. Let the press do their work. And people want me to run into the hole and hide because I was a member of the Tory party? Because my father was chairman for River says I'm a run and hide. No way. I was a member of the Tory party. Number one. Number two, I worked for the Doe government. I can never deny that. No matter what happened with Doe, I was a part of the Doe government. And who in the country didn't work for Doe? I want to ask. Who? Or who in this country didn't work for Doe? Tell me. Show me the person in government today who had no links with Doe. Who? The coup occurred April 1980. When we had a, 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 the occasion to go for... We, I received this letter from the Howard University television station. November 19, 1986. Buya, Press and Cultural Counselor, Embassy of Liberia. This is to cordially invite you to appear as a guest on Evening Exchange, a nightly public affairs program. As you may know, the topic of discussion for this particular segment is Liberia and will focus on the historical perspective as well as political and economic aspects of this West African nation. And it told us the time and everything to go there. I represented the embassy of Liberia at this. The head of the opposition in the United States at that time, Mr. Salif, Ellen Johnson Salif, represented the opposition at this debate on TV. James Botte, representing the press, was there. And the program started. And I was there at a, at a point of disadvantage because this, at this time, November uh, 1986, the Kuangba invasion had occurred. All this human rights thing were in the air. Doe name was in the mud. The ambassador there refused to go and con confront Mr. Salif. She said she was not going. The deputy ambassador said he was not going. 
the political officer said he was not going. And so he said, well, Buya, you the PR man, you go. So I went, carrying my big mouth with me, that all I had. And we went there, and the debate started. And at that point in time, we had a nice discussion. And then, if you know Mrs. Sully very well, she would start gradually and move into full gear. And she moved into full gear. Emmanuel, you know, do is a problem. And once, once, once he can uh, step aside, we can all get together and fix up that country and this and that. I said, yes. Is that what you think? She said, yes. I said, I submit to you, Mr. Salif, that though is not the problem. November 1986. I said, do you know the problem in Liberia? She said, what is the problem? The problem is the system. I told her. I said, if you change the system in Liberia, the problem will be solved. Doe is not the problem. Tobo was not the problem. Tukma was not the problem. Ijo was not the problem. The system is the problem. I have that interview on cassette. I will give you a copy if you want to listen to it. I had it on video, but my friend Eric Scott came to me during the war and borrowed it, and he died in the war, and never returned it. But having a cassette, you can listen to it. So we continued the debate and the discussion and discussion. And she kept on saying that, though is a problem, though is a problem. So then I had to go back into my PR reserve to find out how I could end this debate in a more positive side for my side. And so I said, look, I want to ask you a few questions. And she said, what is that? You know, that's a PR stunt. You simply tell your opponent, I want to ask you a few questions. And they will jump back and say, what are the questions? Then you open them up. I said, Mrs. Salif, um, is it not true that after the coup, you went around to Europe and other places to explain government policies? She said, yes. Is it not true that when you return from explaining government policies in Europe, including Germany and other places, you are made economic advisor to the head of state, though? She said, yes. Is it not true that um, at a certain point in time, you didn't, you were not at the mansion and you were appointed as um, President of the Development Bank, she said yes. I said, is it not true that um, when you were President of the Development Bank, things didn't go very well and you didn't like what was going on, and you decided to leave the country, and then the head of state asked you whether you were vexed with him, you told him you were not vexed with him, and didn't he tell you that if you're not vexed with him, then you should prove that you're not vexed with him? And didn't he tell you that the proof is that you will choose somebody to succeed you at the bank and he will approve that person's name? And didn't you handpick David Vinton to succeed you? She said, yes. I said, well, I submit to you, madam, that though is not the problem. And we had a short exchange and then the TV program was over. I must tell you to her credit, she stood up in the studio, beside, in front of the whole studio audience, extended her hand to me, shook my hands, and said, Boya, no, she said, Emmanuel, congratulations. Thank you for doing the best you could do on a very critical situation. And then the studio started to look for a vehicle to take her back to the hotel where she was residing. I said, the studio can't take you back. I have a government car outside there. I'm taking you back. Put her in the car, convey her to where she was going. Ordinarily, an embassy official would be scared to ride an opposition person in a government car. But Buya got his basic training from his party, now a stupid boy. So I carry her to where she was going. I'm telling you this story to tell you that I'm just, um, I'm just different. I'm just different. I do not.
cope with foolishness. I do what is necessary when I need to do it. I usually collect a lot of things to inspire myself. And one of those things I collected over the years is something written by an anonymous writer. And he, this person said, I do not choose to be a common man. It is my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen. Humble and dull by having the state to look after me. That is why I went and planted my cassava. The state not going to look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build and to fail and to succeed. I refuse to batter, refuse to batter incentive for a goal. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence. The thrill of fulfillment to the still calm of utopia. I will not trade my freedom for beneficence no my dignity for a hand out. I will never cower before any master, nor bend to any threat. Take my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid, to think and act for myself, to enjoy the benefits of my own creation, and to face the whole world boldly and say this, I have done. I'm not a common man. I will bend to no threat. I will not eat grass. My cassavas are growing in fear, man. My seven bunches of planting are waiting to get ripe. I will bend to no threat. Well, I told you already that we got several themes that you are going to discuss. I just want to clear the air on certain themes. Now, I want to come to you to tell you about something that you all been wondering about. Especially my young friends who ask me a lot of questions. You know, since I came home two years ago and started on ELBC, I've had more than six letters from young Liberians telling me they want me to be their role model, they want to do this, they want to do that. And I said, okay. But I haven't interacted with them. Because they don't know they don't they don't know what I passed through. I don't know whether they can pass through what I passed through. But many of them have asked me one thing. They wanted to know what happened November 12th, 1985. What happened? Is it true? That person, Doe, was captured and then later on released because he paid some money? It's not true. He was never captured. I was in charge of a portion of his public diplomacy or public affairs or public relations. I came home in 87 had interviews with several persons, reconstructed the whole story. And I'm going to tell you the story. 1984, let's go back. 1984, you remember when I told you about these people who were planning to overthrow the government in New Jersey and were making all these statements? 1984. By 1985, they had succeeded in getting, getting the um, consent of certain former friends of Doe to come back and liberate the people from those whatever he had. I was then press counselor in Washington, D.C., but before that time, 
I want to go back to this headline in newspaper that said U.S. approached me on those successor. I need to explain it before people misinterpret it. When I talk about those successor, I do not mean his successor in 1980. That's not what I mean. I mean a successor they were looking for as far back as 19. 86. The Nima raid had gone on. Following the Nima raid, they had arrested Kolanko Luo, Johnny Boy Herring, who were working with Jebo before Jebo died, and then he became bodyguard of Kuangba, and some other people, and they had put them in jail. It came to a place where they announced that Johnny Boy Herring and some other people would be executed. By then, I was assigned to the embassy of Liberia in the United States. By then, I was a member. I used to attend Mother Doe's uh, prayer meetings on Wednesdays and Fridays in Silver Spring. Mrs. Thelma Awori, she's now Dr. Thelma Awori, used to attend that same prayer meeting with us. When I got the telex to say that they were going to execute Johnny Boy Heron and some other people, I took the telex to the prayer meeting and told Mother Do that we should pray so that something would change. So that they won't kill these people. And you can ask Ms. Dr. Aori, she was there with us when I said that. And so we declare Wednesday and Friday a period of fasting and praying so that God will change President Doe's mind. That was going on for some time and then by Monday Doe had announced that um, he was still going to execute the people. We continue the fasting and the praying. The ambassador to the United States, George to Washington, Ambassador George to Washington, General George to Washington, was called to the State Department and was told that the American government will not take very kindly continuous executions in Liberia. He was told that in Congress there was a multi-million dollar package being processed to help Liberia. He was told that should we execute Johnny Boy Harry and the rest of the people, Congress will find it difficult convincing the people of the United States that there was need to support the Doe's government. Therefore, Ambassador Washington should inform the government that it would not be in the government best interest to execute Johnny Boy Heron and the rest of the people. I was press and cultural counselor in Washington, D.C. at that time. I was there. Mr. Cronyon Wefo was there. Mr. Nathaniel Brumskin was there. They are all alive. Mr. John Molu was the financial counselor and he knew everything because we kept him up to date. He's now ambassador at large. Check him out. The ambassador returned from the State Department and drafted a telex to President Doe. Because he was a military person, trained the military man, his military language never left him. So the telex said to President Doe, I was summoned to the State Department and I was told that 
the United States government will not approve of you executing these people and it will have financial implications for the money they intend to give you. When Doe heard that, saw that he blew up, what did Boga do with me? The guy didn't do my internal affairs. Oh, he blew up bad. Then he announced, oh, because of the late money they sent for me to have the Constitutional Convention and the election, that why they're doing this thing. Okay, I'll send that money back. And it was announced in Monrovia that President Doe intended to send back the money that the Americans had given him for the Constitutional Convention and the elections. While I served as editor-in-chief of the New Liberian newspaper in 1983, before I was assigned to the United States, I cultivated the friendship of Bradley Swanson, S-W-A-N-S-O-N, -S Swanson who was the political officer at Mamba Point, Embassy of the United States of America. We had a very cordial relationship. When I got in Washington, D.C. as press counselor, Bradley Swanson had been transferred to Washington, D.C. to work with Chester Crocker. And so it became a very good situation for the embassy because now I knew somebody in the State Department. When President Doe announced that he was going to send back the American money because they were interfering in his internal affairs, I received an urgent telephone call from Bradley Swanson, who is still alive, and you can check him out through the State Department. The State Department always know where the former people are at this time. So B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-S-W-A-N-S-O-N, check him out. Call me to the State Department. Boyer, I said yes, he said meet me at the State Department. Do not come through the C Street diplomatic entrance. Meet me in front of the State Department in the park under Albert Einstein's statute. We have some serious talking to do about your country. I will supply lunch. So, okay. I drove from the embassy to the State Department and went straight under the statute and met him sitting there. And he shared the lunch, and I was anxious to know what was going on. And he said, your country is in trouble. And we have determined that you can save the situation. And I said, how? He said, did you hear the announcement from your president? I said, yes. He said, the United States will not take that kindly. He said, for almost 10 years, we have given that man everything he requested of us. Now he wants to slap us in the face by telling us he's going to send back that money to us. He said, I'm telling you, do anything you can do to stop that money from coming back to Liberia because I'm told the United States he said if that money is sent back it will not be good for your country we will not take it with our hands down but before he called me into the park to discuss President Ronald Reagan had gone to a press conference at the White House and some of the press people had asked him we heard that Liberia said they're sending back the money you gave them. What do you think about it? The old man laughed. And he said, well, I tell you, wherever on the globe America interest is jeopardized, we will strike before the world gets the news. 
Wherever on the globe America's interest is jeopardized or threatened, will strike before the world gets the news. That all he said about that question. It was after that that Bradley Swanson invited me to the park. I'm saying it to clarify these headlines because very soon people will go and say, I knew who were coming here in 1990. No, there was a 1985-86 situation. So Bradley said, right now your country has been taken to the situation room. Right now your country has been taken to the top floor of the State Department, which is the situation room. The situation room is a room where when you go, there are monitors all around. And if there is some particular problem in a particular country, they zoom all the satellite on your country and they see every movement that going on. And we are watching situation there on a minute by minute basis. He said, Emmanuel, you have been my friend and I can tell you you can save the situation. Do anything you can do to stop Mr. Doe from sending back that money. He said, because I am working from inside. And he will not be there one day after he sends that money. So I sat there stunned. And then he went on to talk. He said, do you know why he is still there? After he made that announcement? I said, no, sir. He said, because we have not found a viable alternative. Because we have not found a viable alternative. Mr. Swanson is still alive. The American Embassy at Mamba Point and the State Department can link you with him. Check it out. Buya does not lie. We have not found a viable alternative. He said, you know, we have been checking out the situation on the ground. You know, we had thought about Henry Duba, but he too weak. We thought about some other people, but no, we don't, we're not satisfied. And you know, we wanted to go and get piercing from Israel. But we are afraid that if we bring piercing in and do gets to know about it, piercing could die before anything happens. So this is our problem. So... The State Department, knowing that I have worked in Liberia before as the political officer, has contacted me to see what we can do to stop Doe from sending back this money so that we do not have to take action. So, your country destiny is in your hands. I place it in your hand today. Do anything you can do to stop this money from coming. If the money comes, don't blame us for what happens. I was just a press counselor. I was not the ambassador. I was not the deputy ambassador. I was not a political officer. But because of my friendship with Bradley Swanson, he could tell me that. I said, okay, Bradley, I do not have any direct connection with you. But I'm going to talk to people who I think will talk to him. And if you say that if we don't send the money back, everything will be all right. I can guarantee to you that we make everything all right. I left the State Department and I went straight to the office of Mr. John Mullu, who was a financial officer, the same John Mullu who was in charge of Maritime, who is now ambassador. He's still alive. Check him out. I said, John, we're in trouble, man. He said, what happened? I said, our man in Moravia has said something again to stir up trouble. And I explained to John Malu the situation. John Malu said, well, the only thing I can tell you is that I need to get on the telephone and call Gao Jones because he's related to Doe. And right now he's in Switzerland attending a conference. So I told him, John, that conference he attending is zero. Because it's only happened back home, he's not going back. So call him now while I'm standing here. Tell him to get the next available plane and come to Washington, D.C. for damage control. So John Malou called Minister Jones while I was standing there. In a few hours, Minister Jones arrived in Washington, D.C. 
the next day we met at Mr. Molu's office. We explained to Minister Jones what had happened and what the people said. And they told us in no uncertain terms that if Doe insulted the United States by sending back that money, he would not be in the mansion one day after he sent it back. I mean, they made it clear. So we told God Jones we brought him and that I was in touch with Bradley Swanson and a guy at the librarian desk called Joe McBride. And I was going to arrange a meeting with Carl Jones, Joe McBride, Bradley Swanson, John Molu, and myself in John Molu office. Because the State Department had told us that we do not want to deal with the Embassy of Liberia for this time. And we will not deal with our ambassador until he leaves. They said because he is the cause of this problem. Then Swanson told me, he said, don't your ambassador have sense? You say he's been chief of staff, he doesn't know how things operate. He doesn't know that for every telex, telephone call or fax or anything that goes out of the United States from an embassy here, there is an automatic copy retrieved by our NSA. He doesn't know. He is the poisonous pen that, that, that stirred Doe up. He said that one reason why we, we didn't move on Doe because he is the do up for every telex, telephone call, or anything that leaves the United States from an embassy in the United States, an automatic copy is retrieved by the NSA. If it happens here in Liberia, they will, oh, the people invasion of privacy and this and this. The most democratic country in the world, they got their set up there. You talk nonsense, they will hear it, they will deal with you. I came to tell you how the world runs 101. That's the course, how the world runs 101. So Swanson said, we do not want to deal with the ambassador. For the period of this time, we we'll deal with you and John Mullo. We will not deal with anybody in the embassy. And you are not authorized to discuss it with the ambassador. So yes, sir. Why? Because those people don't joke. Something happened in the United States and somebody threatened me and I called the State Department Diplomatic Protective Session and I said somebody had threatened me with this and that and the other. They said, okay, take your pen and paper. I took the pen and paper. They say, uh, Mark, the secret agent Holtz, H-O-L-T-Z. Gave him my tele the telephone number. From now on, until you leave this country, secret agent Holtz will be everywhere you are. You will not see him, you will not know him, but he will see you. Before you leave Washington DC area to go to New York or any part of the United States, inform the protective services of the diplomatic service and secret agent also will be there where you are going before you arrive. You will not know him, but he will know you. So for the time I was there, secret agent Holtz would call me once in a while and talk with me. I never saw the man. I don't know whether he's living or dead. <laughs> Knowing all that, when they told me that I had no authority to tell the ambassador what was going on, I knew I was not going to joke with myself. So I didn't say anything to the ambassador. Ambassador uh, 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 Minister Jones arrived. I brought Bradley Swanson from the State Department, Chester Crocker's office. I brought Joe McBride from the State Department, head of the librarian desk, into John Molu's office. We started talking. We had already briefed Minister June on the whole thing, and he agreed to cooperate. We arrived for the talks. And you know, the American guys, you know, young guys, they just talk anyway, you know, because they're powerful, they talk anyway. So they start talking, and the way they were talking is as if we were staying with them. Then Jones got vexed. Jones said, but look, let me tell you, after all, we are sovereign state. We control ourselves. We're not under you. We are sovereign state. The man said, oh, you're sovereign state? Okay, thank you. He said, Emmanuel, I'm gone. Keep your sovereignty. He walked out of the room. I went to John Molly. I said, you better talk to this man. I'm going to bring your people back here. You talk to this man. Calm him down before I come back. 
I went, I begged the two guys to return. They returned. By that time, Minister June had calmed down. And Minister June said, oh, Bradley, you know you are my river, but I was just joking with you. <laughs> so we arranged a meeting between the Deputy Secretary of State for African Affairs and Minister Jones and their staffs, including Molu and myself from the embassy. The entire embassy staff knew nothing about this operation except Molu and myself. Molu was the finance man, I was the, I was the um, public affairs man. But because Molu was my friend, I could get him because he knew Gao Jones and Gao Jones knew Do. That was a network. We went to the State Department. But Brother Swanson gave us a very good lesson that day. He said, when you go to the State Department, we are going to be meeting for 30 minutes, maximum 45 minutes. He said during that interaction, they will ask you a question. Does Do intend to send back the money? The answer you give will determine your destiny. So you should know how to answer. So we, they left and were hanging head. And I told Minister Jones, I said, you know what happened? You know how situation happens in Morovia. We could be here trying our best to stop something from happening. Somebody could pump somebody up in Morovia. They could make another announcement that would spoil the whole thing. By that time, President Do had gone somewhere out of Morovia, Liberia, in the interim. And that is when they wanted to strike before he got the news. So um, I told Minister Jones, why don't you call President Do now and tell him what we are doing and tell him to keep completely quiet until he hears from you tomorrow evening after the meeting. So Minister Jones called President Doe and talked to him and told him to just let everything be. The next morning we went to the State Department. And in those days, you know, uh, we were younger than now and we were bluff people. Oh, we our double-breasted suits and enter the C Street entrance and we had the diplomatic officers carry us upstairs. And, and Minister June went there as a special envoy of the president because he couldn't just say he was in Switzerland and he heard the news. No, you, got, you got to put something, you got, you, got, you, got, you got to do something, use your head. So Minister June is a special envoy of the president and this and that and we sat down and we started talking and talking and talking. And the same man that became ambassador here later on, Bishop, he was in that same meeting. And then they posed the question, uh, what about this thing we hear that President Doe is going to send back this money we have offered for the Constitution and the elections? A uh, guy just laughed and said, oh man, do mind that. I don't know why the press board got that news from. You know, though sometimes you just joke about things and they just put in the press. No money coming back. Who told you money coming back? We need the money. And everybody calm down. The meeting should have lasted 30 minutes, maximum 45 minutes. When those people heard that the money was not coming back, the, mini, the meeting lasted 90 minutes. They were doing all the talking. And some of what they discuss, you can read it in my book when I publish it later on. Um, what about the end of that meeting was that they, we didn't ask, they offer us additional assistance to build military barracks at Shufflin. And that is when they gave the money to build those two-story buildings when you're coming from. Some of them are not finished yet. That was the day they gave the money for the two-story building that the government never asked them for. That is why I said that I was called and to discuss the successor. Because on that day, if things had gone bad, they would have forced Liberia to have a new leadership. A lot of things happened between 1970 and 1990. And as I said, God always put me in the middle of things. 
I do not plan it for myself. It just happened. That's why when they start to talk about a lady who they say were behind all these things here, I just feel sorry for her because sometimes you don't plan things to be inside. You just find yourself inside. And I have found myself in a lot of mess. So today people criticize me. I don't talk. Because my father said you make a bad bargain, you stick to it. And I have been sticking to my bad bargains. Knowing very well that in the fullness of time, God will allow me to explain. And the fullness of time has come. I could go on and on and on. There was a trial. I'm just giving you headlines. There was a trial of the university students. You remember? I was... I was editor-in-chief of the New Liberian newspaper when the university students were taken to the military tribunal. I was editor-in-chief of the New Liberian newspaper when the students were taken to the military tribunal presided over by General Blamo, Judge Advocate General, no, head of the Supreme Military Tribunal. All other press groups were barred from covering the story. All other press organizations were barred from covering the story except the government press. I must make that very clear. I was editor-in-chief. I had nothing to do with that, but that was what the government said at that time, or that was what the tribunal said. And so we went to cover the military tribunal and the students that included Siafa Blackie, that included uh, one Mr. Brownell, that included uh, Ezekiel Pajibo, and I do not have my notes here, so I don't know the other names, but those are three, I know. When the story started in the courtroom, when the students arrived from prison, there were great jubilation in the halls of the Temple of Justice. That was where it was held. And in the yard of the Temple of Justice, there were all these people shouting, Uhuru, Uhuru, and other slogans. These boys were very animated and they went into the courtroom with their fists in the air then the trial started they looked around and they did not see the private press the independent press only the government press was there and I was covering the story The first day, Siafa Blackie defended their cause and said that because they had arrested their professor, they had declared student politics banned and all of that, it was injustice to them. And he demanded justice and he spoke forcefully. Ezekiel Pajibo also spoke forcefully. Brunel was subdued, he didn't say much. And they told the guards to take them back to the prison. Took them back to the prison. We went and we published a story on them, which you can read in the New Liberian newspaper. Through your research people, they can find that paper at the Library of Congress. They can find it at the American University in Washington, D.C. The next morning, the government changed strategy. Because people were in the yard making all this noise, before they brought those guys from prison, before they brought the, 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 the young students from prison, the government had the entire Temple of Justice yard cleared. Nobody was found in the yard. Everybody who worked in the temple had to be in their offices. 
So when those boys jump out of the truck with their fists in the air, expecting to hear the crowd cheer, there was dead silence. That's when I saw a transformation from a very highly animated group to a group that looked like they had just been taken from under water after several days. They were looking like they were wet and subdued. Then they walked into the courtroom and the judges told them that the crime for what they had done was high treason, punishable by death. What do they have to plead? And Mr. Brownell begged the mercy of the court. Mr. Pajibut begged the mercy of the court, but he talked some tough talk. Blackie also begged the mercy of the court. Then General Blamo said, okay, take them back to the prison. In the meantime, the government broadcasting station was announcing that the people would be executed the next day. And General Blamo turned to me and, the, and uh, Sam To, who was my photographer at the hearing and my other reporters from the New Liberian, and said, look, you will not announce that these boys apologize. Do you understand? I said, yes, sir. You will not announce that these boys apologize. I said, yes, sir. When I announce that, just talk about how we have brought them down guilty and they will be executed. Do not announce that they will apologize. I said, yes, sir. Then I went outside thinking about why is it that the government would not be interested in letting the, stu the people know that these students apologized. I found out later on that it was an orchestrated situation where the boys would not apologize and that though in his own magnanimity would grant them clemency. That was supposed to be the end of the story. But if you announce that the boys apologize and therefore do granted them clemency, then it will look like, uh, it will not be as forceful as saying that the boys did not apologize, but do just forgave them. General Podia was then vice head of state. He and all the other PRC people went to the mansion. As I told you, in those days, I helped to write speeches for the head of state for the former president Talbot and all of that. So Willie Givings invited me to the mansion and gave me the whole deal that the president had informed the, the military government that whatever decision was brought down by the court would be forcefully executed. That way he had told Podio and all the people including um, Abraham Colley and all of that. But Doe plan was to free the boys. He did not tell his colleagues. And because we at the New Librarian knew that these people would not be executed, we assigned government photographers and videographers throughout this town to various population centers to capture the mood of the people when that announcement was made. So Doe came to the, he, he, he announced it from his office with the PRC people standing there and were all there. And he read the report and talked about how these students were incarcerated and recalcitrant and um, defy authority and they were being manipulated by invisible hands and all kinds of things. And the, the military tribunal had brought them down guilty and he had promised that whatever the tribunal said he would do. However, with the power vested in him as head of state, he granted clemency. And all the PRC people were disappointed. And from the mansion, you could hear all across this town rejoicing. 
the very next day, Mr. Pajibo, Mr. Blackie, and Mr. Brunel and others appeared at the new librarian office. Mr. What is his name? Joe Roberts, who now works for the New Democrat, was working with me at that time. Ask him. The new librarian office was in the Ejeroy building. They came to thank me for my coverage of the story. And I couldn't understand why they came to thank me because I didn't do anything for them. What they did not know is that what they wanted was what the government wanted. They did not want me to tell the public that they apologized because they want to be the big heroes. The government did not want me to tell the public that they apologized because the government wanted to, to, to look like he was giving them pardon. So the students and the government had the same secret to hide. And I was the one who was supposed to hide that secret. So many times you hear things in public, you don't know the inside story. But the inside story is that the government and the public and the old students had the same objective. And so everybody went home happily ever after. So that was the military tribunal. Then comes the situation with what I told you I'm going to tell you about. I'm just giving you headlines now. Later on, when you call me for the thematic thing, we're going to go into details. I told you I'm going to tell you about how Doe was not captured November 12th. I did not finish. I stopped and went to something else. I don't forget. I came. I'm coming back. November 12, 1985. The elections were over. Doe had been declared the winner. There were people in the United States and other places who felt that the elections were rigged. Mr. M. Harmon had announced that President Doe had won, head of Doe had won the elections. Because I was working with the Liberian Information Center in Washington, D.C., I, I monitored Mr. Harmon's broadcast live from the Unity Conference Center because the government had money and they could just put the telephone on and put it to the radio and I heard everything. After that, there were plans to come and teach Do a lesson. And so people prepared to come. And it was rumored and later confirmed by some members of that organization that a group that called itself the Liberian Business Caucus was uh, behind plans to come and teach the president-elect a lesson in how to rig an election. And so this planning went on to the extent that this organization found itself in the very center of a plot and a plan to remove Doe before inauguration which was going to be January. So they were going to remove him in November. What, and I'm talking this because of the young people. In this, the what I said yesterday, do not, do not let anybody tell you about country and Congo. They will be fooling you. People do not get together because you are country or you are Congo. People get together because of interests political interests, economic interests, social interests. The Liberian Business Caucus were comprised of people who mostly were hinged to um, the Barovia group, the Bluff Boys, the Affluent Boys, the Business Boys. And so Doe didn't have a real connection to that group. And so that group felt very safe having their meetings behind the information building in the Chamber of Commerce building 
and talking all kinds of things about what they were going to do to do what they did not know is that one of their own members had been elected to a high office in the government that Doe was supposed to take over in January 1986. So this guy panicked. After they got to a certain place, he panicked. Because then it clicked to him that if they mess this guy up, my position is messed up. This guy got nothing to do with Doe. He's not even from the southeast. He's not Barca. He's not crew. He's not Loma. He's not nothing. He's from the newcomer group. And the newcomer group are those who came from Caribbean island. So this guy, on April, I mean November, November, the eve of that invasion, the guy flew to Tucson. Doe had been in Tucson, and the people who were going to plan the invasion were in Freetown, Sierra Leone. I believe if you want to know about this, go on the internet and plug in uh, Dr. Famula's website. He has a 25-page letter outlining this whole thing, including the names of all the people involved. So you got your homework. Do it. So this guy flew to Tucson and told Doe in Tucson that you sitting down here, the people are bringing an evasion tomorrow morning. And it will start at five. So Doe, having his military sense, concluded that if this guy could come and tell me about what his friend's doing, then I do not need to tell him what I would do because he could go and tell his friends what I would do and then any side that win, he will be part of that side. So Doe just told him, okay, I hear what you said. I will take care of it. And Doe told me, he told the guy to leave and the guy left Tucson and came back to Monrovia. That evening, on the eve of the invasion, Doe quietly and secretly got in his jet twin engine small blue jet plane and flew from Tucson and landed at Springsbury Field under the cover of darkness. Got into a tinted glass car and drove to the executive mansion. Got his boys together and told them that he had something to tell them. But he went to sleep and said when he get up he would tell them something. They should all remain in the yard. He went to sleep, got up, shaved himself, got dressed in his commander in chief uniform and called them together and said there will be an invasion here tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. I command you that when it starts don't shoot back. Don't do anything. If they break the mansion down, let them break it down. Don't shoot back until day breaks. Then we will open up. Do you understand me? They said yes. Go to the barracks. Tell the people in the BDC that they should just be on the standby for any orders. Don't say anything else to them. Meanwhile, those who are coming from Freetown, had already written a script and they made Kuangba read the script and the script said that President Doe had been overthrown, he on the run and there's no escape for him and all kinds of things. Arrest all government officials and bring them to the mansion. That tip was recorded before they entered Liberia. And it was authored by two persons who are not friends today. I would not call their names. Go and do your research in Fumbuda's letter. So the two guys wrote the script. Kuomba read it on the cassette. They came, storm LBS, put the tape on. And everybody thought that Doe was doomed. But Doe was sitting in the mansion listening to everything. 
and the bombardment started at five about five and there were no shooting coming from the mansion and the broadcast on the radio was telling people that door has fled and everybody believed it because no shooting was coming from the mansion by daybreak those soldiers opened up and those people who were shooting around the mansion were subdued the poor public did not know what was happening they started arresting government officials and taking them to the mansion when they arrived the mansion guard will open the gate they will take the government officials in the gate will close behind them the officials will be taken to go and eat or to go and sit down and rest somewhere those who brought the official that were the end of their day nobody carried the news out so more people brought more people I was seated in Washington DC as press counselor but I had access to what was happening because I was in touch with people working at the information ministry the mansion and other places and after the occasion I got my briefing so wave upon wave of people brought in government officials they were arrested 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 and nobody had anything in the meantime the commanding general former commanding general was in front of LBS walking up and down and talking about how he did not come to share blood it was videotaped and I saw the videotape he said Grand Jeter and Nimba are the same people he did not come to share blood he just came to liberate the people from Doe dictatorship and all of that well that was what he said and things were going on that he didn't know he didn't know the tide had turned at one time he looked at his watch and he said Papa said that at 2 o'clock the helicopter will arrive we don't know who is Papa the helicopter never arrived how did do come back to power There was a gentleman called Mansfield Yancey. Mansfield Yancey. Mansfield Yancey was a military intelligence expert. He worked nine years under President William V. S. Tupman before Talbot came to power. And when Talbot came to power, he continued in military intelligence. Mansi Yancey was the one who when all of the military security and other forces met in Shufflin in 1984 to nominate Doe to be their presidential candidate it was Mansi Yancey who got up and made a speech nominating Doe with Kuangba invasion Mansi Yancey knew that his day was done because they will remember who dominated Doe now before you get confused about the fact that Doe got nominated in a soldier barracks and you say why he didn't get nominated in a party headquarters or somewhere I must tell you that Doe was not the first to get nominated in a soldier barracks history in Liberia and many places usually repeat itself Mr. Barclay was about to leave office in 1943 there was one James Cooper who was supposed to be running to be president James Cooper and Barclay were all settler people and James Cooper were tough and said that he was going to audit Barclay when he becomes president and Barclay knew the implications of what an audit could do because before, before uh, Cooper started to agitate against Barclay Barclay had already confiscated Charlie King property 
You know the International Trust Company? Down here, they call it something else now. What do they call it? IB? Okay, the IB bank that Charlie King's property. Barclay confiscated Charlie King's property. When Tubman came back to power, he gave it back to the old man and made him ambassador to the United States. So Barclay knew what it was to be audited because then he, his property could be confiscated too. So Barclay panicked and decided to play the regional card. And his argument was that we always got presidents from these three original counties, Maryland, ba I mean, Monserrato, Barca, and Sino. So this time, we have to get a president from the new county. And the new county in those days was Maryland. By that time, Topman was associate justice, a very sociable man, come to town, hang out everywhere, all the boys like him, all the women wanted to be around him, and the women used to call themselves Topman Good Type. <laughs> They call themselves Topman Good Type. And he became popular. And so he fell in love with some of these women around here. And one of the women he fell in love with was Barclay's niece, Antoinette, after whom the Antoinette Topman Stadium is named. So Barclay said, well... It's time for Maryland to produce a president. Topman was married to his wife, Martha Prout. But when he came to town, he was taken care of by Barclay's niece. So Barclay wanted his niece's boyfriend to be this president. Because if that happens, then Barclay thought he could control this boy from Maryland. So Barclay hurriedly took Tupman to United States and introduced him to President Roosevelt as the person he intended to carry as president. President Roosevelt gave his blessing and everything. Because, you know, in those days, it's like the king about to get old and bring his older son and say, this is the king. So all they said, the king is dead. Long live the king. So they came back and Mr. Cooper and his people said they would not stand for a topman being president. Number one, they said he didn't know too much of book. Number two, because he went to Kipama Seminary and he didn't go to Liberia College like the other people. Number two, they say he was a womanizer. Number three, that he loved booze and all of that. So they wanted somebody that you know, would be academic like Barclay who wrote love poems and wrote the Lone Star forever and he could compose music and do all kinds of things. Omen Charlie King could compose music too. A member of our president were intellectuals. J.J. Uh, Roberts left the presidency and went to teach at the University of Liberia and became president of the university. I mean, Liberia College in those days. So they wanted somebody that would come down that strain of being a philosopher, a poet or something and Topmo was just a happy-go-lucky guy who everybody just liked. So when Barclay found out that it was going to be difficult for him to nominate Tupman, and it started to become clear that Tupman was not going to be nominated because even the people in the Tory party had started to say they would not nominate Tupman, Barclay arranged to have his caucus for the Tory party for the purpose of nominating his candidate and the place that Barclay chose to have his caucus was the Barclay Training Center, the military barracks, PTC. Instead of going to the Tree Party headquarters, he called for a convention of the party in the BTC. 1943 to nominate Tupman.
And of course, it was it happened in the evening. It happened in the evening. And when it happened in the evening, no one could enter the military installation except with the expressed invitation of the commanding chief of the army. Because why would you want to be at a military barracks in the night when nobody called you there? You could be charged with something. So they went into the BDC and only those who were now uh, invited by President Barclay could enter the BDC. And there where they had the nomination of President Tuckman to become president of Liberia. The next day it was broadcast all around here by word of mouth that Tuckman had been nominated. So when Doe repeated it in 1984, it was not a strange thing. Our children will always imitate what we do. So we should be careful what we do. Even if our children don't know what we did, by some means they try to imitate something. And so Doe then were imitating what Barclay did in 1943. And so Mansi Yancey was the one who got up and nominated Doe to be the president of Liberia, representing the military and the security forces. On that day, all former immigration officers, all former officers of the NBI, the National Intelligence and Security Service, the Quick Action Bureau, the police, the military, every branch of the government, whether you are active or not active, you had to appear at shuffling. And it was at shuffling that they nominated Doe. After Doe got nominated and the elections went on and everything went going time for them preparing for inauguration, he appointed, he announced the appointment of Mansfield Yancey as ambassador of Liberia to the Republic of Guinea. Mansfield Yancey, who has nominated him, was now declared ambassador to Guinea. All this was in the works when the Liberian Business Caucus machinery was also working. On the day of that invasion, this military intelligence expert, Mansfield Yancey, listened keenly to the tape being played on ELBC. Over and over and over they were playing that tape, that same tape. Mansi Yancey knowing very well that if this thing had succeeded, he would have been in trouble, approached government authorities and told them that it was not Kuang Ba speaking on the radio. It was a cassette of a recording of the voice of Kuang Ba. It was not himself. And therefore, suggested that the whole thing could be turned around if we could only capture that cassette from the radio station. And therefore, the military objective for that day was to capture the radio station and take the cassette off. How do you do that? They had some people from shuffling, counterinsurgency people, to come to the radio station with their rifles in the air as a sign of surrender. They approached the radio station, turned over their rifles, and Kuang Ba told them not to ill treat them, let them sit down. These are the kind of people we like. We didn't come here to kill anybody. So they sat them down. And these agents just watched keenly everything. Check everything out. Some people who say that we didn't have a trained army, I'm sorry for them. We had a trained army. But if you don't treat your trained army like a trained army, they could get wild and go out of way. But they had their basic training. 
by the Americans and by the Israelis, especially the anti-terrorist unit boys. They were trained in counterinsurgency and everything. Very well trained. If you bring some of them back now and put them against the new people, you will have a real good competition. They watched the whole show. And one by one, they got up and said they wanted to go pee pee. They went behind ELBC and took off the military uniform they came with. And under the military uniform were civilian clothes. And with that, they got lost in the crowd and went back to shuffling and planned the takeover of LBS. Mr. Uh, uh, General Kumokba was still in that area, videotaping him, videotaping him, talking, talking, talking. Those boys came back and they exploded something and everybody got confused and the group ran into the place and captured the radio station, took off the tape recording. General Kumokba had to retreat. I do not know the details of what happened to him, but there are a few things I know from reading good books, such books as Inside the CIA, Inside the KGB, Inside the Mossad, good books that were sold in this town that young people should read so they can understand what's happening around them. When you are sent on such missions, they put around your neck a gold chain with a cyanide pill hanging on that chain. A cyanide pill is a pill that when it touches your tongue you die without feeling anything and you die instantly. And they will tell you, like for instance, it is sending me, they will say, well Emmanuel, you know the deal. Uh, if anything should go wrong, we don't know you, you don't know us. Just take your pill and go to sleep. Well, the video revealed that two persons were there jumping up and down, said that they killed the general. The video also revealed that some people said they ate parts of the general. I do not know whether the people who ate parts of the general can stay talk. Because some other people believe that the general was so black when he died that he might have died of his cyanide pill. And so somebody came and shot up the dead body and convinced though that they killed him. Because it was also said that when they captured the radio station and the general made contact with some of his friends in high places, they said, well, Thomas, you know the deal. There's nothing we can do about that. So he knew it was time for the pill. All this time Doe was in the mansion. And Doe came from the mansion, drove, drove to LBS and made a broadcast. And what happened? A lot of people that day were victimized because the information was misused. People in the Senko area were convinced that the general was in power. People in the United States in the Union of Liberian Association were convinced that the general was firmly in power. In fact, the ULAA, the Union of Liberian Association in the United States, sent a fax to the mansion congratulating Kuangba and Do received the fax. True story, ask them. Thomas, who are you? All these people who are in that group, ask them. People, I'm telling you these stories because when it happens again, please know how to act. Don't be too anxious to congratulate. <laughs> so, the people in Sinkor area and Painesville and other places came in droves with palm leaves. I was in the U.S., but as a journalist, I reconstructed the whole story from notes 
and interviews. The king rushing up past by the uh, what a place name city hall, and when they reached in front of the Catholic Church, they were the Moag looking down on them, and the Moag opened up and dump truck full of people were removed on that day because of a PR blunder that told the people that a general was in charge when in fact it was a cassette plane. Damage control is a specialized area of public relations. You don't take lay boys to play with public relations. You run into trouble. I'm telling you these stories because someday they might happen again and please know what to do. Keep cool. Wait until the sun go down before you decide to go to bed. Don't go to bed before the sun go down. You don't know who's coming. So that is for that. I will say the last thing before I go or before the commission can ask me questions. And that is, what happened with me and Doe? How come Buya and Doe parted company? Why did we part company? In fact, how did we get together? How did he know me? How do we become friends? And I'm telling you, he was my friend. I don't run away from my friends, no matter how bad you talk about them. I don't run away from them. I stick by my friends. He was my friend. I had been appointed Minister of Information. He came to me after about 30 days to congratulate me for the way I was doing my work. We went to the cabinet meeting and he brought up suggestion. Everybody say yes. And if I thought it was no, I would say no. And I was warned by some of the bigger guys that, you know, I got to be careful because, you know, my time might not be long in the cabinet. I said, okay, but I had just come from Washington, D.C., being a member of the National Press Club or rubbing shoulders with people that I didn't care about whether I stay in the cabinet or not. It was in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club that I introduced Mr. Lamini Warite, who was press secretary, press, no, president of the Press Union of Liberia, to a group called the Committee for the Protection of Journalists. Why did I introduce Mr. Warite? Because I wanted a journalist in Liberia to have link with a group in the United States. So when they got in trouble, like they usually get in trouble, it will not just be, just be a Monrovia trouble, it will be a trouble that the journalists in the other parts of the world will cry out and support them. Mr. Lamini Warite is alive. He works with the Telecommunications Corporation or Commission or something. But ask him, when I was Minister of Information, a lot of newspapers got closed down in this town. A lot of radio stations got banned. But I challenge anyone to say that I did it. It was done by the government through other agencies. The president would tell me, go and close that station down. I would say, yes, sir. I would go home, eat my food, and go to sleep. He would call me back. I told you to do it. I said, yes, we're working out the modalities. Nothing will happen. He will get angry and order somebody to go and do it, and they will do it. Oh, beautiful for Petra's dream that sees beyond the years. Not because the president said, do something, just jump out and go do it. See beyond the years when you have to account for what you do. So I challenge anybody in this country or outside of this country to say that Buya came and did this. Or Buya lied on us and we went to jail. I was the one in the background begging for radio stations to be open and I got several examples but I'm not going to give it until somebody opened their loud mouth and lied on me. 
So as I was saying, Do came and congratulated me and all of that. Warite and myself became friends when he was in the press union as president and I was minister of information. And when foreign journalists came to this country, I told them that we have a Liberian policy, a Liberian culture that when you enter town, you don't just run and talk to the town chief. You have to go to somebody who is your stranger father in that town who will bring you to the town chief. So as of the time I became Minister of Information, no foreign journalist had a right to come to me and say, I want to be accredited. I do not know you. Until you pay courtesy call on Lamini Warrior, the press, the, the president of the press union, who will bring you to me? Then I know you. Why? Because you follow our culture. You got a stranger father to introduce me you to me. By that, I empowered the press union. So no, there was a time in this country that foreign journalists came, went straight to the mansion, got thousands of dollars for public relations, wrote all kinds of things, ignored the Liberian press. And I was in the Liberian press. I was a member of the press union. And when I became minister, I reversed the whole thing. And everybody had to respect the press union. I thought to make that point clear. We went to cabinet meetings, and in the cabinet were very few there. When I got there, I was the youngest at that time, and then uh, uh, Shaw was next to me in terms of age. I mean, I was next to him because I was below him. And so, even when the cabinet had recess, I could only talk to Shaw because everybody else looked at me like I didn't belong there. So later on, um, do call me and say, you know, um, I had you been Minister of Information before. I said, yes, sir. He said, he now director of LBS. I said, yes, sir. He said, but uh, I think he, he, he feel that, that, that he's supposed to be with us. So I want to make him, I want him to attend cabinet meeting. What do you say? I said, yes, sir. I agree. Let him come in, my friend. So I'll had you decided to attend cabinet meeting. And then Shaw came to me and said, boy, I'm surprised at you. I said, what happened, Shaw? He said, man. He said, you don't know the essence of power. I said, what do you mean? He said, you jump on the board. You got a man working under you on the, on the same cabinet with you. I said, what Shaw? What do, man? Let him come. No problem. He's not taking my power. We'll all be there. So Kuma was there. I was there. Another thing I will tell you again is that Mr. Taylor, Mr. Tiller attended the cabinet meetings too. He was GSA director. No GSA director attended the cabinet meeting until Tiller became GSA director. And the reason is, and the reason is that Tiller was going around collecting 17 videos, 17 this, 17 that. And every time the cabinet met with the PRSC, they would start fussing about who didn't have what. Somebody visited you and they see a person got a Zenith Betamax and somebody got a Sony Betamax and they argue about how Taylor gave the person something better than the other person. So they always had to send for Taylor. One day Doe got vexed and said, but why we got to send for the man all the time? From today on, anytime we have a cabinet meeting, you'll be here. So Taylor came to the cabinet meeting. So things happen here by time and circumstance. So what I'm telling you is that Do one day, Do sent his special security service man to my ministry. The guy came and banged on my door so hard, I thought I had done something. I opened the door and he said, the president said, I should tell you that he's going behind the mansion to play football with the executive lions. And he wants you to go with him. And he wants you to play football with him today. He said, the president said, he know you ain't got no uniform. So go to Sam Bernard's sports store. I think it was Center in Kerry Street. Tell him to give you a complete set of borrowed uniform. Everything, the whole set, he will pay for it. So, okay. I went there, told him the president said, I should come. So they were anxious to sell, they gave me everything. They gave me something to tie around my head. They gave, they gave me the t-shirt. They gave me something to put around my, my, my wrist. They gave me the knee guard, the shin guard, the, the boots. The, they, gave, they just gave me a surplus. So I got dressed like I could play. And I couldn't play. I went behind the mansion. They 
game started. Fred Blay is the perpetual referee. Always there. Blue Eraser will start playing. In about 10 minutes, I was completely exhausted. I started to walk off the field. Ashi Bernard said, Boya, I said, yes. So where are you going? I said, I'm tired. I'm going to rest. But the chief didn't tell you to rest. How you can rest? I said, what? I am tired and I am going to rest. And walk off the field. When those women walking off, he knew that power was shifting. Because I was no longer doing what the chief said. And I had just come from America, I didn't have time for no chief business. So he yelled at me, Boy, I said, Yes, sir. You tired? I said, Yes, sir. He said, Go sit down. I was going to sit down anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but that is what I call power play. The chief had to tell you to sit down. Okay. So I went and sat down. When I went and sat down, he left the field and went under the plum trees where he usually sits. I asked the security to move everybody from that area and he told me come and sit by me I sat by him he said Boya you know I know you don't play football you know that you're not a football man I know you he said the only thing I, get, I don't know where you sleep in the night you're always all around I said chief I sleep in my house he said you don't sleep in your house I said well when you want me you come and find me I'll be in my house so he said I didn't call you here to play football you know I said yes sir he said, the thing I call you today is very serious. But if I had told you in my office, you think I'm talking to you because I'm president. And I don't want to talk to you because I'm president. I'll talk to you because you're my crowd of born. He said, when you were born, I said, January 17, 1950. He said, but I was born May 1950. I said, but then you're my small brother. He said, yeah. He said, I was keen to talk to you, man. I said, what's that? He said, I want you to be my friend. I said, what? He said, I want you to be my friend. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you see all these people around me? All the ministers around me? They just fool me all the time. He said, you're the only person who's been telling me the truth around here. Anything I want to do by you, tell me no. All the other people, they, they fool me. They bring me BB fire. They say, you do that thing, the country will develop. You do that thing, the country will develop. So I try it, it's fair. They say, do it, no book. So I want you to be my friend. Anything in this country I'm doing and you do you see it is not good, stop me, I will stop. But just don't tell me when other people there call me once and just tell me to stop. He said that all I can to tell you, he walked off and went to play football. And I went home. I am just telling you these things to tell you that there are times that no matter how bad you perceive the person to be, that person still wants somebody who can tell him, shut up, stop, don't do it. And it was good he gave me that authority. Because on December 31st, 1988, I received a press release from the office of the president sent by the Minister of State, G. Alvin Jones, he's still alive, informing me that's as of January 1, 1979, 1989, 89. as of January 1, 1989, 1989, yeah, the government was going to increase the price of rice. So what? So I said I cannot publish this. I called Minister Jones on the telephone. I said, I see a press release here from the mansion saying that the price of rice is going up tomorrow. He said, yes. I said, I cannot publish it. I'm sorry. He said, oh, the president left that release when you were going to Tucson yesterday. I said, yes, sir. I can't publish it. Tell him I will not publish it. In the meantime, I contacted my friend Emmanuel Shaw. Emmanuel Shaw was against it. But what I did not know is that Emmanuel Shaw had been dismissed that same day, the night before. Because apparently he was against this increase in the price of rice, and those people who wanted to increase the price of rice gang up and had Shaw dismissed. They just called the president up and told the president 
that's sure I've been speaking at the Chamber of Commerce or somewhere and have made some remarks against President Tubman. And President Doe used to like President Tubman, he wanted to be President Tubman. So if you say anything bad about President Tubman, President Doe will deal with you. So President Doe just told the president, okay, and now I sacked the man. They didn't even contact me. I was Minister of Information. They didn't even tell me. It was just announced early that morning that Doe has sacked Shaw as Minister of Commerce and he was supposed to turn over everything effective immediately. It was that same morning they brought me in this thing to see the price of rest had increased because they had defeated Shaw now. And so I was the gatekeeper who was supposed to announce this thing. When I was sitting here April 14th, Looking at what was happening, I told Minister Jones, no way. Call the president and tell him I am not announcing it. I called Kuma on the walkie-talkie and told him I don't want to hear on ERBC. If they bypass me and come to you, don't announce it. You got my authority. Tell him I say so. So Minister Jones said, well, I'm not going to tell the president. You can go and tell him. I said, well, make Make it make the plane available. I'll go and tell him. He said the plane leaving ten o'clock. Go there. I said okay. He said, but mind your booyah. The president just dismissed Shaw this morning. I said yeah, he can dismiss me too. I will go have my mom say her kuye. But I will not announce this thing that I was here for April 14 and saw, saw it. Tomorrow is 1989. 1979 we had a rice riot. Tomorrow is the 10th anniversary of the rice riot and the first headline is that we're increasing the price of rice. I will not do it. I will not do it. I'm not going down with this ship. So I went to the airfield. Got into zone. They, of course they had told the president I was coming. So he drove to the airfield himself with his bodyguard Nathan Nelson in the front seat with him. He brought the, the car to the airplane. I got down, he said, get inside. To Nathan Nelson, get in the back. Nathan Nelson got in the back. I sat in the front with him. He said, how you come here? I said, I'm all right. But we couldn't talk much. The securities were there. And again, when you when you travel with president and big people, you don't talk. Let the president talk first. Saying he didn't want to talk, I was not going to talk. So we just kept quiet. He drove me to the house. Got down out of the car, just ran in the house. Just got out of the car, slammed the door and ran in the house. So I got down and started walking to the house. So I said, halt. I said, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with you? They see me coming with, it, with the president. He said, but well, the president did not tell you to go in your house. I said, oh, no. So I knew something was cooking up. So I said, okay, I stood outside for 10 minutes. They said, okay, the president said you can come in. I went in. Instead of setting me in the living room where the guests are. See that? He told me to sit among the security on one hard chair. Then I knew, no, he had his own way of doing things. And he vexed for you, he tried to make you feel uncomfortable a little bit before he brings you to him to subdue you. And my basic psychology and sociology told me that I had to know how I approach him. He went into his room area and he came downstairs. When he was coming, we all had to stand up and he went into his office. He spent about 15 minutes in his office, then he sent for me. When I got there, he acted like he had not seen me since the sun came up. Yeah, my man, what you say? The same man who drove me from the F.E. I said, Lord, help. Anyway, I kept calm. I said, well, I came to see you about two things. He said, yeah, why are the two things? I said, number one, you dismissed Minister Shaw. He said, yeah, I dismissed him. So what? I said, well, it's your prerogative to dismiss anybody because we serve at your will and pleasure, but you said you dismissed him because he said bad things about President Tubman. I said, he said, yeah. I told that short man to leave Tubman. Every time we're talking, he talk bad things about Tubman. I told him to leave the old man alone. What, what did the old man do to him? <laughs> so, <laughs> I had to calm down. So I said, well, I submit to you, sir, that he did not say anything bad about President Tubman. Here is the, the audio tape of the speech. Here is a copy of the speech on paper. Nothing bad was said. And I'm the Minister of Information. You dismiss the Minister of Commerce without even telling me. I heard it on the radio. He said, look, Buya, let me tell you something here. That's your bad luck. 
I show up by love. You see them? <laughs> he said, I show by luck. I told sure to leave the old man alone. So say he won't leave the old man that bad luck unto him. So tell me something else, man. I want to hear that show up in there over now. I finished appointing somebody else. I said, okay. The next thing I came to tell you about is I received a press release from the minister from the mansion. Minister June sent me a press release that you want me to inform the public that effective tomorrow, New Year Day, 1989, that you are announcing that the government is increasing the price of rice. He said, yes. I said, is that what you really want to announce on New Year Day? Is that a good news you got for the people? He said, look, Buya, let me tell you something. When I came to power, I said I came to defend the people human rights. Rights. I didn't tell I came to get them rights to eat. You understand me? I said, yes, sir. He said, so go and now. I said, what's wrong with that? I said, well, let me tell you something. And usually when I talk with the president at that time, I do not address him as president. I tell him, I said, look, you know what happened? You are president and minister. We know that, but we are crowd about. So let's put the minister and president down once. I let talk crowd about talk. I said, look, if I were your opposition, eh, and you announce that you're carrying the price of rice up, I will call party for three days. We'll just dance and drink liquor. Have a fun time for three days. At the end of the three days, I will announce to the people that the same problem I brought tower down, that same thing you're looking for now. I said, do you know that tomorrow is the New Year Day, the 10th anniversary of the rice riot? And the only news you got to tell the people is that you're going to do the same thing again. He said, what a paper. I gave him the press release. He tore it up, put it in his basket. <laughs> he said, let's go. Let me show you my farm. <laughs> what I'm telling you here is, <clears throat> I'm not trying to make myself look good. I'm just telling you the things I had to go through to help to maintain some stability here. Deal with the kind of mentality you're dealing with. You have to have the proper relations skills to know what to say, when to say it. And know the psychology of the person you're dealing with. Because all you go, I said, go announce it. I just said, no. I will tell the people that you're doing the same thing Tobit did. Instantly, he told up the paper. And he said, okay, thank you very much. We're not carrying the price of rice up. He carried me, showed me his farm, showed me everything, showed me the Kavala River where his people used to pass from the Ivory Coast to come as, ma as migrant laborers to Tucson. And Tucson means under the tree. There were no houses there long ago. People came from the Ivory Coast, stood under the trees, and people from Swedry and other places came and took them to go work for a day and took them back, and they went back to the Ivory Coast. So that how that town developed two zones under the tree. He told me all of that, put me back in the car, we came to town. After that, people got behind here again to carry up the price of rice. It was announced that the government were considering carrying up the price of rice. My old lady was selling the market. I came home that evening. And I asked the old lady, what the food? She said, the food on the table. I went to the table, opened the, there was only one bowl on the table. Opened it, there was a big bowl of soup. I called, I said, but what the rice? She said, what rice? And you say, you can't the to rise up? When you go up, you have rice to eat? He said, look, let me tell you something. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I told you, you got queen sense and country blood. Let me tell you something. God bless you, you're a small, small boy, you're in government. They think they kill all people for that, I think you're going to do it again. So since you are doing it, go eat that soup. I'm cooking no rice for you. You're going to get the pressure right, or you'll see what will happen with you. I went back to the mansion, talk, and we had to kill that idea. In the government, there are always all kinds of people competing.
waiting for the president's attention. The president is an unfortunate victim of circumstance. The president is always a scapegoat. Everybody uses the presidency for their own purpose. No matter whether the president got MA, BA, PhD, or like do graduated from the Marcus Garvey High School. Do you know where the Marcus Garvey High School was? That where he graduated from. It was organized by people from Moja. And they were teaching there. And they were teaching Do. In 1976, 77, 78, before the Red Riot. And they cannot tell me it is a lie because a ginkgo had placed me at the Ministry of Education. I was a Ministry Assistant to the Minister. And I received a National Security Briefing from the NSA every Monday morning. And Mr. Fuma Salif can let people do the research for this committee and you'll find that list there. 1977, 78, 79, when the NSA was informing the Ministry of Education that a group of university professors had organized the Marcus Garvey High School opposite the demonstration school on Clay Street and they, were, they had recruited these soldiers and other people and according to the NSA report, they were brainwashing them in revolutionary activities and socialist doctrine. And the same people that executed the coup, their name were on the list of students at that school before the coup. Tell them Buya said so. I was administrative assistant to the, to the minister. I received the report and I took it to Dr. Huff. If the NSA got good records, they will find it, but I don't think they can find it. Why? Because a few weeks ago, I went in the street, and my ground beef seller was selling me some ground beef in sensitive documents with NSA letterhead. <laughs> and these were documents from the Taylor era. I do not know whether they have anything from the Tolba era. Do became president of the student council of Marcus Garvey High School. Mistress Esther Zulu, who ran the cafeteria at the Capitol building, and I think she's still there. She was one of Doe classmates at the Marcus Garvey High School, and she received the money from Doe to run his campaign as student council president. All my witnesses are alive. The boys from Moja organized Marcus Garvey High School. So they knew Doe and Doe knew them before the coup. They knew Doe and Doe knew them before the coup. I did not say they helped him to plan the coup. I said they knew him and he knew them. By 1982, Doe and Joy Sigbert Bole fell out in the mansion. Doe decided he didn't want Bole to be a minister of state anymore. Transfer Bole to the Ministry of Education. And they sent me a press release because I was assistant minister and special assistant to the Minister of Information. Sent me a press release to announce that Doe had been pleased to appoint Mr. Emma C. Sawyer as Minister of State for Presidential Affairs. I received that document. And I have my copy among my papers in the United States. And I'm sure Mr. Valentine can help you to find a copy on the mansion file in the executive mansion. Few minutes after we received that document, I got a call from Mr. Willie Givings, and he's still alive. Willie Givings told me, look, you don't announce Sawyer's name because uh, uh, he had called here and said he doesn't want to be Minister of State. He got interest in being head of the Constitutional Commission, and so he talked to his, his student, and um, Joe had agreed to put him on the Constitutional Commission, so you shouldn't publish his name, scratch your name off, we'll tell you in a few minutes who will succeed Bully. That when they brought Harry, now you. 
and later on John Ransom. I'm just telling you things you wanted to hear me talk. I'm talking. Don't knew soya, soya knew do before they cook. So nobody pay oh well, we didn't know these people. They just took us from jail and caught us to the mansion and this and this. You knew these people. You knew these people and they knew you. This is the time for brave men to stand up and tell the truth. Tell the truth and if it's bad, tell them you're sorry. But tell the truth first. <laughs> so people, Liberia is a deep place. Long, deep, mysterious history. If you don't listen to it, they will tell you lies. Yesterday I closed by talking about how we tend to play down certain persons who have made contribution in the past. I must tell you that in the 1950s and 1960s, the French people controlled the Sahara Desert, Algeria and all those places, Morocco and all those places controlled by the French. And the French had a way of testing their nuclear and atomic bomb in the Sahara Desert, especially in the 60s. And once a year in this country, in Liberia, ask your grandma when you go home, and your grandpa if they stay alive, or your grand uncles. Once a year, we knew it as flu season, FLU. Once a year, we we'll all get sick in this town, people will die, we knew that. A lot of people will die once a year. I forgot what month it was, but we can do the research. So the flu season came, people die, and then we know the flu season was over because the French people have finished testing their bomb. When they test their bomb in the Sahara Desert, all the air, the wind come down this way, we get sick and we die. And what can we do about it? Nothing. There were some brave boys who decided they were fed up from the University of Liberia and other places. You have boys like Kringer Harris, William Appleton, and others who decided they were fed up with this thing. They, they marched on the French embassy in Morovia. Demonstrated. When Kringer Harris was demonstrating, his father was in the, in the government as assistant minister for Coast Guard at the defense ministry. He put his father's career on the line and demonstrated. Government got vexed. They had them arrested. Abaddon later rebelled, went to the Soviet Union, enrolled at Friendship University, Patrice Lumumba Friendship University. Government got vexed with him, declared that he was no longer a Liberian citizen, when in fact there had no law to do that. You ever hear the president got power to say you're not a citizen anymore? <laughs> but what happened with Abaddon? And Appleton could not return to this country until Topman died. There were no uh -oh, human rights group here to talk for Appleton. When Topman said, you are not a citizen, you are not a citizen. I brought that up to say that for every generation in this country from time immemorial, there will always be an element of young people speaking out. But the wrong thing we do in this country is that when that generation has passed, and a new generation of people come to speak out. They act as if they were the only one on the scene and they were the first to do it. That's a lie. Today, I want to present to you Kringa Harris. Please stand. <laughs> you are one of those who carry the, 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 the protest to the French people. How many of our journalists make research to know that? But soon these late upstarts come and won't act like they are the only one who ever thought about human rights in our lives. That what happened with Liberia. Every leader wants to kill the other leader, the image of the other leader that, came, that we left behind. So we go on on a rampage to kill people's images. And so we never improve. You go to Washington DC, they will show you the Lincoln Museum, the Washington Museum, the all kinds of museums. To Liberia, show me one president's museum. Soon that president is passed, we don't want to hear about him. And soon this one passed, we don't want to hear about her. 
that Liberia a bunch of people who got no sense of history no sense of history Excuse me, audience. Excuse me. Hello. We told you this morning. Please. We will not allow clapping. We told you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You see, I'm very happy when I was leaving the United States to come home in, 19, in 2004. Five. December 18, 2005, I told my wife, I have a feeling that when I, would, when I die, I will be a happy old man. She said, what kind of happy old man? You ain't got no money. I said, that now I will be happy. I'll be a man who will pass on to a new generation, a new idea of what Liberia should be. And I'm happy I can come home to address this crowd. To pass on to this new generation a Liberia that does not discriminate on the basis of how you look, how you sound, or where you came from. A Liberia that will respect you for what you can do. In 1975, the United Nations observed the International Decade of the Women. I was writing my final paper in sociology at the University of Liberia. And I chose to write on women in the struggle for national development, a review of women's suffrage in Liberia, 1944 to 1975. For that research paper I interviewed a lot of women in Monrovia area on their view of women leadership in the future this was 1975 one of the questions I had in that document that research document was did those women at that time ever believe that in their own lifetime there will ever be a woman president of Liberia. Do you know that all of them except one person say yes? And I interview about 13 prominent persons. All except one. And that one person was president of the College of West Africa. Mr. Cecilia Freeman Bull who is sitting over there. My witnesses don't die. She was president of CWA. I still have my interview papers with her name on it and the day and date that I interview her because I'm a journalist who keep records. Young people learn to keep your record. But the research projected that in the not too distant future, that will come to pass. It was myself, a gentleman called Unzuba Kopa, who later became Unzuba Kimen Gamai. Are you here today? Is Unzuba here today? He might be listening on the radio somewhere, but he called me and he just arrived in town last week. He had my roommate at the University of Liberia. He, myself, Dr. Conte, Kankala, and other people got together at that time and ran a campaign to elect a woman as the first representative of the student council to the university council. That the first time we got a seat on the university council and we said we we're going to give it to a woman to celebrate the international decade of the woman. And we elected Pauline Wiade Koba. Today, 
all over Liberia we hear about oh women suffrage and women rights. In 1975, a bunch of men at the university knew that long before the UN people came riding in white jeep to tell us the news about women suffrage. I just say that to say that people in Liberia do not keep the history, they do not remember anything. And that is why we are suffering so much. One of my friends called me from down Waterside a few months ago. There was an argument there involving a Nigerian and some other people about how they came here to help Liberia. Because we are a failed state. They came here to help us, to put us back on track, and they were developed, we were not developed, and this boy called me and said, uh, 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 you can help us? Didn't you tell us one time that we help Nigeria too? I said, yes. So he said, I, he said, please talk to this man. They put him on. I said, hello, young man. He said, hello. I said, do you know a gentleman called Namdi Azigui, your first president of Nigeria? He said, yes, I'm our first president. I said, well, I just want to tell you he was our scholarship student. The government of Liberia gave him scholarship to go and get his PhD when the British government would not allow him to attend their schools. He came back and he wrote a book entitled Liberia in World Politics in appreciation for what we did for him. Did he ever tell you that? He said, no, I didn't know that. I said, please be informed. I said, do you know that during your Biafran war, our Vice President Talbot got in a twin engine small plane and flew to Nigeria to make sure he made peace so you couldn't kill yourselves up? After he visited there, Gowon came to this country and Namdi Azikwe came here and Topman told Azikwe not to go back to his Igbo people but to fly into Lagos and declare that as president of the first republic of Nigeria, he Azikwe wanted a united federation of Nigeria. Do you know that Nam Azikwe did exactly what Topman, Topman told him to do? Top, Topman? And it was stopped eventually. If today we are fighting in our own house and your Nigerian soldiers have come here to help us, when you do not know your own history, is that how you would talk to us? When in fact you only came to pay homage to what we did for you before? If we didn't educate your first president, who would have been your first president? Do you know? I mean, I like to be arrogant sometimes when it's necessary. From when our people do not know our history and they, all they know is April 14. When we all turned crazy and broke this place up. That all they know April 14. A generation of breaker ups. Mr. Chairman, you know I trained to be a preacher. And sometimes uh, I do not know the difference between a speech and a sermon. But I want to tell you that I think I should rest a little bit and you just ask me questions and I will talk more as you ask questions. Because I could talk to this group on that tomorrow morning. The only thing I want to say to you and to this group is that this should not be the last time we meet. In fact, I have a strong feeling, Mr. Chairman and members of this commission, that we agree, we thank our foreign friends for helping us to set up this TRC. But this TRC has to become a self-help project. The Liberian people should raise money so we can have this TRC here for as long as we want it. So now we're going to talk about war business. To talk about everything. There are too many things we need to watch. Just a small part of what we need to talk about. We need to have a national historical society to really debate the issues and write a new history so our children will not be brain damaged by one-sided history. History written by some Congo person who talk about the savages. History written by another PhD country person who talk about the other people. We want a history in the middle of the road. So I make myself available to any group at any Hatai shop, any city hall, anywhere who want to discuss Liberian history. I will come there free of charge and make sure you get a taxi to take me there and bring me back. Thank you very much.